This recording is a product of Audio Anarchy. Manufacturing Consent, Chapter 3. Legitimizing versus Meaningless Third World Elections, El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua. And before I begin reading, I'm going to make a comment here that uh, currently, if you're discussing uh, what was formerly called the Third World or Developing uh, Nations, uh, now the accepted terminology is the Global South. However, I will be reading uh, this text as written. Third World elections provide an excellent testing ground for a propaganda model. Some elections are held in friendly client states to legitimize their rulers and regimes, whereas others are held in disfavored or enemy countries to legitimize their political systems. This natural dichotomization is strengthened by the fact that elections in the friendly client states are often held under U.S. sponsorship and with extensive U.S. management and public relations support. Thus, in the Dominican Republic in 1966, and periodically thereafter, the United States organized what have been called, quote, demonstration elections, unquote, in its client states, defined as those whose primary function is to convince the home population that the intervention is well-intentioned, that the populace of the invaded and occupied country welcomes the intrusion, and that they are being given a democratic choice. The elections in El Salvador in 1982 and 1984 were true demonstration elections, and those held in Guatemala in 1984 to 1985 were strongly supported by the United States for image-enhancing purposes. The election held in Nicaragua in 1984, by contrast, was intended to legitimize a government that the Reagan administration was striving to destabilize and overthrow. The U.S. government, therefore, went to great pains to cast the Nicaraguan election in an unfavorable light. A propaganda model would anticipate mass media support of the state perspective and agenda. That is, the favored elections will be found to legitimize, no matter what the facts. The disfavored election will be found deficient, farcical, and failing to legitimize, again, irrespective of facts. What makes this another strong test of a propaganda model is that the Salvadoran and Guatemalan elections of 1982 and 1984 through 85 were held under conditions of severe, ongoing state terror against the civilian population, whereas in Nicaragua, this was not the case. To find the former elections legitimizing and the Nicaraguan election a farce, the media would have had to use different standards of evaluation in the two sets of cases, and more specifically, it would have been necessary for them to avoid discussing state terror and other basic electoral conditions in the Salvadoran and Guatemalan elections. As we will see, the media fulfilled these requirements and met the needs of the state to a remarkable degree. In order to demonstrate the applicability of a propaganda model in these cases, we will first describe the election propaganda framework that the U.S. government tried to foist on the media. We will then review the basic electoral conditions under which elections were held in the three countries. And finally, we will examine how the U.S. mass media treated each of the three elections. 3.1. Election Propaganda Frameworks The U.S. government has employed a number of devices in its sponsored elections to put them in a favorable light. It has also had an identifiable agenda of issues that it wants stressed, as well as others it wants ignored or downplayed. 
central to demonstration election management has been the manipulation of symbols and agenda to give the favored election a positive image. The sponsor government tries to associate the election with the happy word democracy, and the military regime it backs with support of the elections, and hence, democracy. It emphasizes what a wonderful thing it is to be able to hold any election at all under conditions of internal conflict, and it makes it appear a moral triumph that the army has agreed to support the election, albeit reluctantly, and abide by its results. The refusal of the rebel opposition to participate in the election is portrayed as a rejection of democracy and proof of its anti-democratic tendencies, although the very plan of the election involves the rebels' exclusion from the ballot. The sponsor government also seizes upon any rebel statements urging non-participation or threatening to disrupt the election. These are used to transform the election into a dramatic struggle between, on the one side, the born-again democratic army and people struggling to vote for peace, and on the other, the rebels opposing democracy, peace, and the right to vote. Thus, the dramatic denouement of the election is voter turnout which measures the ability of the forces of democracy and peace, the army, to overcome rebel threats. Official observers are dispatched to the election scene to assure its public relations success. Nominally, their role is to see that the election is fair. Their real function, however, is to provide the appearance of fairness by focusing on the government's agenda and by channeling press attention to a reliable source. They testify to fairness on the basis of long lines, smiling faces, no beatings in their presence, and the assurances and enthusiasm of U.S. and client state officials. But these superficialities are entirely consistent with a staged fraud. Fairness depends on fundamental conditions established in advance, which are virtually impossible to ascertain under the brief guided tour conditions of official observers. Furthermore, official observers in sponsored elections rarely ask the relevant questions. They are able to perform their public relations function because the government chooses observers who are reliable supporters of its aims and publicizes their role, and the press gives them respectful attention. I pause the text to read a footnote. In the case of the Salvadoran elections of 1982 and 1984, the government relied on the media to play down not only this plan, but also the fact that the rebels were driven into rebellion by decades of refusal of the army to allow any democratic option, and that the rebels could not have participated in the election anyway because they would run heavy risks of being murdered. The five leaders of the political opposition in El Salvador were tortured, murdered, and mutilated in San Salvador in November 1980. As we pointed out in Chapter 1, the government and other power groups try to monopolize media attention not only by flooding the media with their own propaganda, but also by providing authentic and reliable, quote, experts, unquote, to validate this propaganda. And two footnotes on these so-called election observers. Quote, the observer delegation's mission was a simple one, to assess the fairness, honesty, and propriety of the voting, the counting of ballots, and the reporting of final results in the Salvadoran elections. Senator Nancy Kassenbaum, report of the U.S. Official Observer Mission to the El Salvador Constituent Assembly elections of March 28, 1982. Report to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, 97th Congress, 2nd Session, page 2. This agenda 
does not include consideration of any basic framework conditions like free speech and the absence of state terror that determine in advance whether an election can be meaningful. See the text below and another footnote. The New York Times even allowed the right-wing Freedom House observers to dominate its reports on the election staged by Ian Smith in Rhodesia in 1979, articles of April 22nd and May 11th, 1979. Although a brutal civil war raged and the rebel black groups were off the ballot, Freedom House found the election fair in a rerun held a year later under British government auspices, the black candidate sponsored by Ian Smith, who had received 65% in the quote-unquote fair election, got only 8% of the vote, whereas the previously excluded black rebels received a commanding majority. Freedom House found the second election doubtful, See Herman and Broadhead, Demonstration Elections, Appendix 1, Freedom House Observers in Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, and El Salvador. Back to the text. Off the agenda for the government in its own sponsored elections are all of the basic parameters that make an election meaningful or meaningless prior to the election day proceedings. These include, one, freedom of speech and assembly, two, freedom of the press, three, freedom to organize and maintain intermediate economic, social, and political groups, unions, peasant organizations, political clubs, student and teacher associations, etc., four, freedom to form political parties, organize members, put forward candidates, and campaign without fear of extreme violence, and five, the absence of state terror and a climate of fear among the public. Also off the agenda is the Election Day coercion package that may explain turnout in terms other than devotion to the army and its plans, including any legal requirement to vote and explicit or implicit threats for not voting. Other issues that must be downplayed in conforming to the government propaganda format are the U.S. government's role in organizing and funding the election, the internal propaganda campaign waged to get out the vote, outright fraud, and the constraints on and threats to journalists covering the election. Another issue off the government agenda is the purpose of the election. If its role is to influence the home population, spelling this out might arouse suspicions concerning its authenticity. In the case of the Vietnam election of 1967 and the El Salvador elections of 1982 and 1984, the purpose of the elections was not merely to placate the home public, but also to mislead them on the ends sought. In both instances, it was intimated that an election would contribute to a peaceable resolution to the conflict, whereas the intent was to clear the ground for intensified warfare. Nobody who proposed a peace option could appear as a serious candidate in Vietnam in 1967, and, as we described below, there was no peace candidate at all in El Salvador in either 1982 or 1984, although the polls and reporters kept saying that peace was the primary concern of the electorate. This highlights both the fraudulence of these elections and the urgency that the intentions of the sponsor be kept under wraps. In elections held in disfavored or enemy states, the U.S. government agenda is turned upside down. Elections are no longer equated with democracy, and U.S. officials no longer marvel at the election being held under adverse conditions. They do not commend the army for supporting the election and agreeing to abide by the results. On the contrary, the leverage the dominant party obtains by control of and support by the army is put forward in this case as compromising the integrity of the election.
Rebel disruption is no longer proof that the opposition rejects democracy, and turnout is no longer the dramatic denouement of the struggle between a democratic army and its rebel opposition. Now, the stress is on the hidden motives of the sponsors of the election, who are trying to legitimize themselves by this tricky device of a so-called election. Most important, the agenda of factors relevant to appraising an election is altered. From the stress on the superficial, long lines and smiling faces of voters, the simple mechanics of election day balloting, and the personalities of the candidates, attention is now shifted to the basic parameters that were off the agenda in the sponsored election. As noted by Secretary of State Schultz, quote, The important thing is that if there is to be an electoral process, it be observed not only at the moment when people vote, but in all the preliminary aspects that make an election meaningful, unquote. Spelling this out further, Schultz mentioned explicitly that for elections to be meaningful, quote, rival political groups, unquote, must be allowed, quote, to form themselves and have access to people, to have the right of assembly, to have access to the media, unquote. These remarks were made apropos of the 1984 Nicaraguan election. No congresspersons or media commentators raised any question about whether these criteria should perhaps be applied to the Salvadoran or Guatemalan elections scheduled during the same year. In brief, the government used a well-nigh perfect system of Orwellian doublethink, forgetting a criterion, quote, that has become inconvenient, and then, when it becomes necessary again, drawing it back from oblivion for just so long as it is needed, unquote. It even acknowledges this fact. A senior U.S. official told members of the Latin American Studies Association, LASA, observing the Nicaraguan election, quote, the United States is not obliged to apply the same standard of judgment to a country whose government is avowedly hostile to the U.S. as for a country like El Salvador, where it is not. These people, the Sandinistas, could bring about a situation in Central America which could pose a threat to U.S. security. That allows us to change our yardstick. Unquote. But while a government may employ a blatant double standard, media, which adhere to minimal standards of objectivity and are not themselves part of a propaganda system, would apply a single standard. Did the mass media of the United States follow a single standard in dealing with the elections in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua? Or did they follow their government's agenda in order to put the Salvadoran and Guatemalan elections in a favorable light and to denigrate the one held in Nicaragua? 3.2. Basic electoral conditions in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua, 1982-85. through 85. All three of these countries, in which elections were held in the years 1982 to 1985, were in the midst of serious conflict. Nicaragua was being subjected to regular border incursions by the U.S. organized and supplied Contras. El Salvador was in the midst of a combination civil conflict and externally U.S. organized and funded counterinsurgency war. Guatemala, as we noted earlier, had evolved into a counterinsurgency state with permanent warfare to keep the majority of Indians and other peasants in their place, and violent repression was structured into the heart of the political system. Despite the common feature of ongoing conflict, however, electoral conditions were far more favorable in Nicaragua than in El Salvador and Guatemala for several reasons. First, 
and crucially important. In the latter countries, at the time of the elections, the army was still engaged in mass slaughter of the civilian population, with the toll in the tens of thousands in each country, and the killing often carried out with extreme sadism. Nothing remotely similar was true in Nicaragua. These facts, which are not controversial among people with a minimal concern for reality, immediately establish a fundamental distinction with regard to the electoral climate. In countries that are being subject to the terror of a rampaging murder machine, supported or run by a foreign power, electoral conditions are fatally compromised in advance, a point that the media would recognize at once if we were considering the sphere of influence of some official enemy. A further and related distinction was that the ruling Sandinista government was a popular government, which strove to serve majority needs and could therefore afford to allow greater freedom of speech and organization. The Lassa report on the Nicaraguan election notes that their program, quote, implies redistribution of access to wealth and public services. The state will use its power to guarantee fulfillment of the basic needs of the majority population, unquote. The, quote, logic of the majority, unquote, the report continues, also implies the involvement of, quote, very large numbers of people in the decisions that affect their lives, unquote. Qualified observers conclude that the Nicaraguan government pursued this logic, although this fact is excluded from the free press. After citing the World Bank's observation that, quote, governments vary greatly in the commitment of their political leadership to improving the condition of the people and encouraging their active participation in the development process, unquote. Diane Melrose of the charitable development agency Oxfam states that, quote, From Oxfam's experience of working in 76 developing countries, Nicaragua was to prove exceptional in the strength of that government commitment, unquote. The Salvadoran and Guatemalan governments, by contrast, were ruled by elites that had been struggling desperately for decades to avoid the very kinds of reforms the Sandinistas were implementing. Extreme repression was the long-standing method of control of the majority in El Salvador and Guatemala, with vigorous and unceasing U.S. support. The aim of this repression was to keep the populace apathetic and to destroy popular organizations that might lay the basis for meaningful democracy. The Sandinistas were engaged in mobilizing the majority and involving them in political life, which they could afford to do because their programs were intended to serve the general population. A third factor affecting electoral conditions was that in El Salvador and Guatemala, the conflict was internal, and violence against the majority was integral to the struggle. In Nicaragua, the conflict was one involving an externally sponsored aggression that had very limited internal support. The Sandinistas could appeal to nationalist sentiments easily mobilized against Yankee-organized terrorism. The Salvadoran and Guatemalan governments could hardly do the same. The Salvadoran government especially had to contend with a negative nationalist reaction to obvious foreign, i.e. U.S., domination and manipulation of its affairs, a fact that reached the level of absurdity when Duarte, visiting Washington in the fall of 1987, made himself an object of ridicule throughout Latin America by promptly kissing the American flag. 
While the Sandinistas did increasingly crack down on internal supporters of the Contras as the conflict intensified, by the standards the United States usually applies to this region, dissenters were dealt with remarkably benignly in Nicaragua. In El Salvador and Guatemala, the ruling elites could not afford such toleration, and repression by large-scale terror had long been institutionalized in these states. A fourth factor making for a more benign electoral environment in Nicaragua, paradoxically, was U.S. hostility and the power of its propaganda machine. Every arrest or act of harassment in Nicaragua was publicized and transformed into evidence of the sinister quality of the Sandinista government in the free press of the United States. Meanwhile, as we described in Chapter 2, the Guatemalan and Salvadoran regimes could indulge in torture, rape, mutilation, and murder on a daily and massive basis without invoking remotely proportional attention, indignation, or inferences about the quality of these regimes. In the context, the Nicaraguan government was under intense pressure to toe the mark, whereas the U.S. satellites were free to murder at will without serious political cost. Let us examine briefly how El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua compared in the individual categories of conditions of a free election before we turn to the media treatment of these issues. 3.2.1 Free Speech and Assembly In El Salvador, the right to free speech and free assembly was legally suspended under a state of siege order of March 7, 1980. Decree number 507 of December 3, 1980 essentially destroyed the judicial system, permitting the armed forces to hold citizens without charge or evidence for 180 days. Under these rulings, in the 30 months before the March 1982 election and prior to the 1984 elections, many thousands of civilians were seized, imprisoned, tortured, raped, and murdered outside of legal processes for alleged subversive actions and thoughts. The state of siege was lifted in early 1982 solely for the six parties contesting the election, and it was lifted entirely ten days before the election for all Salvadorans, although, unfortunately, the citizenry was not informed of this fact until after the election was over and state of siege conditions were reimposed. The practice of exposing mutilated bodies for the edification of the citizenry became institutionalized in the early 1980s in El Salvador. We described in Chapter 2 the difficulty the U.S. government had in getting underlings jailed, tried, and convicted for the murder of four American citizens, even under intense U.S. pressure. The people of El Salvador had no protection whatsoever from the state terrorists, apart from that afforded by the guerrilla army in the regions under their control. The threat of extreme violence by the state against dissident speech was acute in El Salvador in 1982 and 1984, and was incompatible with a free election. In Guatemala, similarly, during 1984 and 1985, and for many years before, the actions of the armed forces against alleged subversives was entirely outside the rule of law. Thousands were seized, tortured, and killed without warrant and without any individual right to hearing or trial. As in El Salvador, mutilation and exposure of the tortured bodies became commonplace in the late 1970s and 1980s. The courts were dominated by the military, as the latter would simply not execute or obey a court order of which they disapproved. And the judges were not inclined to challenge the military for reasons of dependency or fear. Even Viscount Colville of Colross, the special rapporteur of the UN General Assembly, who has been a notorious apologist, 
for the Guatemalan regime, after pointing out that over 80 members of the judiciary, court staff, and legal profession had been murdered in the early 1980s, and that many others were threatened, says that, quote, such events make their mark and cannot quickly be mitigated, unquote. Two illustrations of the lack of court autonomy may be noted here. In May 1983, Ricardo Sagastume Vidare, then president of the Supreme Court, was simply removed by military order for attempting to bring military personnel under the jurisdiction of the legal system. On July 19, 1984, Colonel Talmi Dominguez, head of public relations for the army, told the newspaper Prensa Libre that the army wouldn't tolerate its members being taken to court on any charges. In the early 1980s, following the mass killings and village destruction of 1980 through 1983, vast numbers of peasants were resettled in model villages and other places under army control, and over 800,000 males were made obligatory members of civil patrols with military functions under close army surveillance. According to the British parliamentary group that visited Guatemala in 1984, quote, The civilian patrol system is implemented by terror, and designed also to sow terror. People who do anything out of the ordinary come under immediate suspicion and are taken by the patrols to the army's destacamiento. Interrogation will be done by the army, but the killing of murdered suspects is often by the civilian patrols, unquote. Bishops Taylor and O'Brien, representing the Roman Catholic Bishops' Conferences of Scotland and England-Wales respectively, reported after their visit to Guatemala in 1984 that, quote, The civilian populace is under almost total control by a heavy army and police presence throughout the country, which we were able to observe. There is also a nationwide network of civil defense patrols, military commissioners and informers, and model villages serving in some cases as internment camps for the Indian population from the areas of conflict. Much of Guatemala resembles a country under military occupation. One of our informants summed up the situation by saying that the military had established a system of structural control. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, following an on-site visit in May 1985, also found that freedom of speech and assembly did not exist in Guatemala. Quote, The right of assembly and freedom of association considered in Articles 15 and 16 of the American Convention are also restricted and curtailed because existing security measures in the development poles and the strict supervision of the civil defense patrols inhibit residents from taking part in any social, ideological, cultural, or other assemblies or associations all such meetings, when they do occur, are subject to surveillance, supervision, and control by the authorities, so they do not enjoy the freedom implied by such rights. Unquote. Public demonstrations were permissible in Guatemala during the 1984 through 85 elections, with three days' advance notice and the approval of military authorities. In the Guatemalan context, however, this grant of rights was not meaningful. The delegation of the International Human Rights Law Group and the Washington Office on Latin America noted that whatever the election guarantees, quote, the military and civilian defense patrols and the climate of fear also made it difficult for many Guatemalans to organize and assemble. One local observer said that years of terror and oppression against local organizations had demobilized the whole rural population. Quote, Four CUC Peasant League members were killed in this village alone. Now it would be very difficult to organize any kind of group, unquote. Civil patrols, police and army checkpoints on highways, and the need for travel permits for residents of the model villages impeded free movement. <laughs> 
In the rural areas, the civil patrols discouraged gatherings because people feared being reported. Unquote. It was noted by many observers of the Guatemalan elections that although the big issues in that country were land distribution and reform and human rights, no political candidates discussed or advocated either land reform or restructuring the military and forcing an accounting of tens of thousands of disappearances. One Christian Democratic advisor explained to the law group that, quote, We Christian Democrats haven't raised such issues because this isn't the moment to start a confrontation with either the army or the private sector, unquote. In short, despite the, quote, momentary improvement in the conditions of free speech, unquote, that occurred during the election campaign, Guatemala did not meet the first condition of a free election. The rural masses were under army discipline and traumatized by mass killings and the absence of any vestige of rule of law, and the candidates were unable to raise openly the fundamental issues of the society. Free speech and rights of assembly were constrained in Nicaragua in 1984 by social pressures and threats and by a state of siege that had been terminated some six months prior to the November 1984 election. Very important differences existed, however, between the Nicaraguan constraints and those prevailing in El Salvador and Guatemala, most important, in Nicaragua, the army and police did not regularly seize alleged subversives and torture and murder them. Mutilated bodies have not been put on public display as a part of the system of public education. What the law group called the, quote, constant overt political terror, unquote, in Guatemala, based on, quote, numerous documented massacres of whole villages, unquote, and what the former Salvadoran official Leonel Gomez called the state of, quote, fearful passivity, unquote, prevalent in El Salvador, did not apply to Nicaragua. In Nicaragua in 1984, dissidents were able to speak freely without fear of murder, and the Lassa group noted that, quote, every member of our delegation was approached at least once by an irate citizen as we walked around Managua and other cities. Several of these encounters turned into heated arguments between the individual who had approached us and passers-by who joined the discussion. These people did not feel intimidated, unquote. Freedom of assembly in Nicaragua was somewhat limited by harassment, but once again, it was not ruled out by state terror, as was the case in El Salvador and Guatemala. The Lassa delegation examined in detail the charges of Sandinista harassment of opposition group meetings and found them largely unfounded concluding that the contesting parties, quote, were able to hold the vast majority of their rallies unimpeded by pro-FSLN demonstrations, unquote. Our conclusion is that the first basic condition of a free election was partially met in Nicaragua, but was not met at all in El Salvador and Guatemala. 3.2.2 Freedom of the Press In El Salvador, the only substantial newspapers critical of the government, La Crónica del Pueblo and El Independiente, neither by any means radical papers, were closed in July 1980 and January 1981, respectively, the first because its top editor and two employees were murdered and mutilated by the security forces, the second because the army arrested its personnel and destroyed its plant. The church paper and radio station were repeatedly shut down by bombing attacks. No paper or station representing the principal opposition has been able to operate except clandestinely. Over 30 journalists have been murdered in El Salvador since the revolutionary junta took power. 
an intensified campaign against the press occurred just prior to the 1982 election. On March 10th, a death list of 35 journalists was circulated by a, quote, death squad, unquote. And on March 18th, the mutilated bodies of four Dutch journalists were recovered. None of the murders of journalists in El Salvador was ever solved. They were essentially murders carried out under the auspices of the state. In Guatemala, 48 journalists were murdered between 1978 and 1985, and many others have been kidnapped and threatened. These killings, kidnappings, and threats have been a primary means of control of the media. As in El Salvador, nobody has yet been apprehended and tried for any of these crimes, which must be viewed as murders carried out by the state or with state approval. There are no papers or radio or television stations in Guatemala that express the views of the rebels or the majority Indian population or the lower classes in general. Quote, At most, the variants reflect shades of strictly conservative thinking, unquote. Given the extreme climate of fear and threats for stepping out of line, even the conservative press is cautious and engages in continuous self-censorship. All the central topics that should be debated in this terrorized society are carefully avoided. In Nicaragua, once again, there have been no reported deaths of journalists by state terrorists, nor even threats of personal violence. In 1984, the majority of the 50-odd radio stations were privately owned, and some of them provided their own news programs. Four other independent producers supplied radio news programs without prior censorship. Foreign radio and television from commercial and U.S. propaganda sources broadcasting from Costa Rica, Honduras, and elsewhere were of growing importance in 1984. Two of the three newspapers were privately owned, one supportive of the government but critical of specific programs and actions, the other violently hostile. The latter, La Prensa, which represented the small, ultra-conservative minority and supported the Contras and a foreign-sponsored invasion of the country, was allowed to operate throughout the 1984 election, although it was censored. The censorship still allowed the paper to publish manifestos of opposition groups and a pastoral letter critical of the regime. No comparable paper has been allowed to exist above ground, even briefly, in El Salvador and Guatemala. There is no doubt that the media in Nicaragua have been under government constraint, with censorship and periodic emergency controls that seriously encroached on the freedom of the press. It should be noted, however, that Nicaragua is under foreign attack and in a state of serious warfare. John S. Nichols points out that under the U.S. Espionage Act of 1917, over 100 publications were banned from the mails, and hundreds of people were jailed for allegedly interfering with military recruitment. Furthermore, quote, Given that the U.S. was a relatively mature and homogenous political system during World War I and was not particularly threatened by the fighting, the range of public discussion tolerated in Nicaragua during the first five years of the revolution was remarkable. Despite assertions by President Reagan, IAPA, and others that the control of the Nicaraguan media was virtually totalitarian, the diversity of ownership and opinion was unusual for a third world country, particularly one at war." Unquote. Our conclusion is that the condition of freedom of the press necessary for a free election was clearly absent in El Salvador and Guatemala, and that it was partially met in Nicaragua. 3.2.3 Freedom of Organization of Intermediate Groups 
Perhaps the most important fact about El Salvador in the two years prior to the election of March 1982 was the decimation of popular and private organizations that could pose any kind of challenge to the army and oligarchy. As we noted in Chapter 2, this was the main thrust of policy of the Revolutionary Junta from late 1979 onward and thousands of leaders were murdered, and numerous organizations were destroyed or driven underground. The teachers' union was decimated by several hundred murders. The university was occupied, looted, and closed down by the army. Organized student and professional groups were destroyed by arrests and killings, and even the peasant union sponsored by the AFL-CIO, i.e. supporters of the regime, had some 100 of its organizers and leaders murdered between October 1979 and the election of March 1982. In Guatemala, too, intermediate organizations such as peasant and trade unions, teacher and student groups, and professional organizations have been regularly attacked by the armed forces since 1954. The process of demobilization of institutions threatening the dominant elites culminated in the early 1980s, when by government proclamation, quote, illicit association, unquote, was made punishable by law. All groups, quote, which follow or are subordinated to any totalitarian system of ideology, unquote, evidently an exception is made of the Guatemalan armed forces and the national security ideology, are illicit. Only the armed forces determine when illicitness occurs. If General Mejia Victores finds the GAM mothers to be agents of subversion, they may be killed. See chapter 2. Unions, peasant groups, student and professional organizations have grown up periodically in Guatemala only to be crushed by systematic murder as soon as their demands were pressed with any vigor. The 1984-85 to 85 elections followed the greatest era of mass murder in modern Guatemalan history under the regimes of Lucas Garcia, Rios Montt, and Mejia Victores. Union membership in 1985 was below its 1950 level, and other urban groups were decimated or inactive. The peasant majority was totally demobilized and under the tight control and surveillance of the military. In Nicaragua, again, the contrast with the two U.S. clients is marked. Under Sandinista management, there was a spurt in union and peasant organization. A deliberate attempt was made to mobilize the population to participate in decision-making at the local level and to interact with higher-level leaders. Oxfam complements the Nicaraguan government highly for this effort, as we pointed out earlier. There is legitimate debate over the extent to which the grassroots and other organizations sponsored by the ruling FSLN are independent, and whether they might not be a vehicle for both state propaganda and coercion. Oxfam America and its parent organization in London clearly find them constructive. Luis Hector Serra, contends that the grassroots organizations are relatively autonomous and that their close relationship to the leadership of the FSLN, quote, did not obstruct their capacity to express the concerns of their members at the local level, unquote. He concludes that the popular organizations were, quote, profoundly democratic, unquote, in their effects of involving the populace in decision-making and educating them on the possibilities of participation in public life. The difference with the organization of the Guatemalan peasantry in, quote, poles of development, unquote, where the essence of organization was, quite openly, military control by terror and enforced non-participation is quite dramatic, whatever one's general assessment of the FSLN popular organizations may be. We conclude that on the third basic condition for a free election, El Salvador and Guatemala did not qualify in the years 1984 to 85. Nicaragua did. <laughs>
at least to a significant degree. 3.2.4 Freedom to organize parties, field candidates, and campaign for office. No party of the left could organize and present candidates in the 1982 and 1984 elections in El Salvador. The Democratic Front, FDR, had been quickly driven underground. Five of its top leaders were seized in El Salvador in November 1980 by official and paramilitary forces and were tortured, mutilated, and killed. A year before the March 1982 election, the army published a list of 138, quote, traitors, unquote, which included virtually all politicians of the left and left center. Colonel Gutierrez, a powerful member of the junta, had stated forcefully that the FDR could not participate in the election because it was a, quote, front, unquote, for the guerrillas. The invitation to the FDR and the FMLN to lay down their arms and compete in the election was thus fraudulent, a fact confirmed by the admission of the U.S. Embassy that the FDR could not safely campaign in El Salvador, with the accompanying suggestion that they might do so by means of videotapes sent in from outside the country's borders. Subsequently, even Duarte, the preferred candidate of the United States, was unable to campaign outside San Salvador in 1982 for fear of murder, and scores of Christian Democratic politicians were killed in the years 1980 through 84. In short, not only radical, but even pro-U.S. mildly reformist parties could not escape decimation by political murder during those years. It should also be emphasized that no party could organize and run candidates in El Salvador that put high priority on terminating the war by negotiations with the rebels. What makes this especially important is that reporters and observers were unanimous in 1982 that the main thing the public wanted out of the election was peace. The propaganda formula for getting out the vote in 1982 was ballots versus bullets, with the implication that ballots were a possible route to a reduction in the use of bullets. If, in fact, no peace candidate was eligible to run, the election was a fraud for this reason alone. Defenders of these elections have argued that there was a substantial difference between the candidates, especially between Dobuisson and Duarte, so that voters had a meaningful choice. But Dobuisson and Duarte did not disagree on the central issue of interest to the Salvadoran people, whether to fight to win or to strive for a negotiated settlement with the rebels, both were members of the war party, with only tactical differences. Although Duarte made occasional demagogic claims that he would talk with the rebels and bring about peace, he never spelled out a peacemaking agenda, never went beyond suggesting, quote, dialogue, unquote, as opposed to negotiations, which imply the possibility of substantive concessions and never departed from the position that the rebels should lay down their arms and participate in the new, quote, democracy, unquote, that Duarte and the army had established. Duarte joined the junta at a moment of severe crisis in March 1980 when all the progressive civilians had left and immediately after the murder of the Christian Democratic Attorney General Mario Zamora, by the newly prospering death squads. It was clear that the army and affiliated death squads had embarked on a policy of large-scale massacre. Duarte provided the fig leaf and apologetics that the army needed for the second Matanza. We believe that Duarte never would have received U.S. support and protection and could not have survived in El Salvador unless he had made it clear that he was in basic accord with the aims of the U.S. administration and the Salvadoran army. 
From 1980 onward, Duarte always accepted fully the pursuit of a military solution and no compromise with, quote, the subversives, unquote, a phrase that Duarte uses continually, just as do the army and death squad leaders. As Raymond Bonner points out, quote, the repression in 1980 reached a magnitude surpassed only by the first Matanza and was far worse than anything imagined under General Romero. By the end of the year, the number murdered had reached at least 9,000. Every day, mutilated bodies, missing arms, or heads were found behind shopping centers, stuffed in burlap bags, and left on dusty rural roads, hurled over cliffs into ravines. Unquote. And through all of this, Duarte not only provided the facade of, quote, reform, unquote, he regularly complimented the army for its loyal service. In a letter published in the Miami Herald on November 9, 1981, Duarte wrote that, quote, the armed forces are waging a heroic battle against a cruel and pitiless enemy, supported by great resources of ideological aggression. This goes parallel with armed aggression. This would be one more prey in the conquest plan in the Central American region that Moscow has designed to pursue. Immediately after that, its greatest reward would be the North American nation. Unquote. In brief, the Salvadoran public was never offered the option that the press itself acknowledged the voters craved. In Guatemala, as in El Salvador, no parties of the left participated in the 1984 election for a constituent assembly, and only one crippled party made a tentative but wholly ineffectual foray in the 1985 presidential election. The main guerrilla movements were, of course, outside the electoral orbit. Their leaders would have been killed if apprehended, but they would not have participated anyway without a drastic alteration in basic social and electoral conditions. Even a centrist party, like the Christian Democrats, had suffered scores of murders in the years 1980 to 83. And the current president of Guatemala, the Christian Democrat Vinicio Cerezo, survived three known assassination attempts. No seriously left party could have qualified in 1984 to 85 under the laws of illicit association mentioned earlier. The peasant majority was not represented or spoken for by any candidate. The Guatemalan Human Rights Commission, an organization not able to function within Guatemala, has pointed out that national political parties that speak for major groups like the working class or indigenous people, quote, do not exist, and as a result, these sectors are institutionally excluded from the political system, unquote. America's Watch states that one of the civil patrol system's functions is, quote, to provide vigilance and control of the local population, preventing any form of independent political organization, unquote. This exclusion of the peasantry from any political opportunity was reflected in two ways in the 1984 to 85 elections. One was that in registering for the election, only 3% of the electorate signed up as members of political parties. Another, more compelling, is that no candidate in the election urged land reform, although this was one of the two central issues in Guatemala, the other being unconstrained army murder, also not an issue in the election given the understanding on all sides that the army will remain the ruling force, whoever gains office. As with Duarte in El Salvador, the presence of Vinicio Cerezo as a candidate and as the eventual winner in the 1985 election raises the question of whether, despite the constraints on the left, Cerezo did not really offer a significant option to the voting public. Cerezo differentiated himself from his electoral rivals, especially toward the end of the campaign and the runoff, by expressing compassion for the masses and a determination to make changes in the human rights picture and mass poverty. He occasionally mentioned the need for structural reform, although he was not specific, and stressed that the first requirement was to reestablish civilian control. 
He was quite clear, however, that if he were elected, his power would be nominal at first and would have to be enlarged while he was in office. Quote, the election will not bring automatic transfer of real power to the president. There will be a handover of formal power. What are my chances of consolidating that power? 50-50. Unquote. During the election campaign, Cerezo never straightforwardly addressed the question of land reform, and news reports in Guatemala suggested that he had promised the landowners' lobby that land reform was not on his agenda. Similarly, he did not promise any legal action against those who had murdered thousands, nor did he say that he would dismantle the counterinsurgency state. There would seem to have been at least a tacit understanding between Cerezo and the military that he would protect them against prosecution and preserve their power and relative autonomy. In fact, he could not do otherwise and survive. In the year and a half that has elapsed since he took office, Cerezo has made no meaningful move toward land reform, has supported the army vigorously against any accounting, and has made no move to dismantle the civil patrols, the development poles, and other features of institutionalized terror. The human rights situation in Guatemala, quote, remains terrible, unquote, although improved but partially because higher rates of killing are no longer deemed beneficial. The poor, for whom he expressed so much compassion during the electoral campaign, have suffered further losses in real income, as Cerezo's, quote, reforms, unquote, have accommodated the demands of the army and oligarchy. He is on very poor terms with the mutual support group. Thus, the post-election pattern shows that Cerezo, in part by prior agreement, but more decisively by structural constraints, has been entirely unable to serve his mass constituency. In the 1984-85 election, Cerezo gave the Guatemalan people an opportunity to vote for a man of seeming goodwill and good intentions, but one unable to respond to democratic demands and opposed by the real rulers of the state. In Nicaragua in 1984, the spectrum of candidates was much wider than in El Salvador, Guatemala, or, for that matter, the United States. The conservative Democratic Party and the Independent Liberal Party both issued strong calls for respect for private property, reduced government control of the economy, elimination of press and other controls, and a foreign policy of greater non-alignment and accommodation. Both were able to denounce the Sandinistas for the war and to call for depoliticization of the army and negotiations with the Contras. Arturo Cruz, after lengthy negotiations with representatives of the government, chose not to run in the 1984 election, but this was a voluntary act of Cruz, albeit under heavy U.S. pressure. In contrast with the position of the left in El Salvador and Guatemala, and was not based on physical threats to his person or limits on his access to the populace. The FSLN had a strong advantage over the opposition parties as the party in power, defending the country from foreign attack and having mobilized the population for their own projects of development. The Lassa group felt that much of the incumbency advantage of the FSLN was characteristic of governments everywhere, and concluded, quote, it seems clear that the FSLN took substantial advantage of its incumbent position and in some ways abused it. However, the abuses of incumbency do not appear to have been systematic, and neither the nature of the abuses nor their frequency was such as to cripple the opposition party's campaigns or to cast doubt on the fundamental validity of the electoral process. Generally speaking, in this campaign, the FSLN did little more to take advantage of its incumbency than incumbent parties everywhere, including the United States, routinely do, and considerably less than ruling parties in other Latin American countries traditionally have done, unquote. 
we would conclude that the ability of candidates to qualify and run and the range of options was substantially greater in Nicaragua than in El Salvador and Guatemala. Furthermore, as all major political groups of the left were off the ballot by threat of violence in the latter two cases, those elections fail to meet still another basic electoral condition. 3.2.5 Absence of State Terror and a Climate of Fear During the years 1980-84, to the death squads worked freely in El Salvador in close coordination with the Army and security forces. The average rate of killings of civilians in the 30 months prior to the 1982 election was approximately 700 per month. Many of these victims were raped, tortured, and mutilated. All of this was done with complete impunity, and only the murder of four American women elicited by dint of congressional pressure any kind of legal action. Even William Doherty of the American Institute for Free Labor Development, a longtime supporter of U.S. policy in El Salvador, asserted before a congressional committee that there was no system of justice operative in that country, while Leonel Gomez, a former land reform official in El Salvador, told the same committee a bit later that state terror had put the population in a state of, quote, fearful passivity, unquote. In Guatemala, too, the endemic fear based on years of unconstrained and continuing army violence was a dominant fact of national life. According to America's Watch, writing in early 1985, quote, Torture, killings, and disappearances continue at an extraordinary rate, and millions of peasants remain under the strict scrutiny and control of the government through the use of civil patrols and model villages. Guatemala remains, in short, a nation of prisoners. Unquote. The law group described Guatemala in 1985 as, quote, a country where the greater part of the people live in permanent fear, unquote. In the case of Nicaragua, we repeat the central fact that differentiates it from the U.S. client states. In 1984, its government was not murdering civilians. The main fear of ordinary citizens in Nicaragua was of violence by the Contras and the United States. Our conclusion is that the fifth condition for a free election was met in Nicaragua, but not in El Salvador and Guatemala. And our overall finding is that neither El Salvador nor Guatemala met any of the five basic conditions of a free election, whereas Nicaragua met some of them well, others to a lesser extent. 3.3. The coercion packages in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. As we noted, in the U.S. government's sponsored elections, voter turnout is interpreted as public support for the election and its sponsors. In disapproved elections, here Nicaragua, this frame is abandoned, and voter turnout is either ignored or declared meaningless because of limited options or coercive threats by the authorities. But the question of coercive threats should clearly be raised in all cases where this is a potential problem. As we have just described, the elections in El Salvador were held under conditions of military rule where mass killings of subversives had taken place and a climate of fear had been established. If the government then sponsors an election and the local military authorities urge people to vote, a significant part of the vote should be assumed to be a result of built-in coercion. A propaganda model would anticipate that the U.S. mass media make no such assumption. And they did not. In El Salvador, in 1982 and 1984, voting was also required by law. The law stipulated that failure to vote was to be penalized by a specific monetary assessment, and it also called on local authorities to check out whether voters did, in fact, vote. 
This could be done because at the time of voting, one's identification card, ID cedula, was stamped, acknowledging the casting of a vote. Anybody stopped by the army and police would have to show the ID card, which would quickly indicate whether the individual had carried out his or her patriotic duty. Just prior to the March 1982 election, Minister of Defense Garcia warned the population in the San Salvador newspapers that the failure to vote would be regarded as an act of treason. And in the 1984 election, quote, Advertising by the government and military prior to the elections stressed the obligation to vote rather than the freedom to vote, unquote. Given the climate of fear, the voting requirements, the ID stamp, the army warning, and the army record in handling, quote, traitors, unquote, it is evident that the coercive element in generating turnout in Salvadoran elections has been large. This is supported by queries made by independent observers on the reasons why Salvadorans voted. In Guatemala, as in El Salvador, voting was required by law. Non-voters were subject to a fine of five quetzales, $1.25. Also, as in El Salvador, newspaper ads sponsored by the army asserted that it was treasonous to fail to vote or to vote null or blank. The law group reported that, quote, many, unquote, people expressed fears that non-voting would subject them to reprisals, and after the military threats in the week before the election, there was, quote, a widespread belief that failure to vote would be punishable by more than the five Quetzal fines stipulated by the law, unquote. In Nicaragua, while registration was obligatory, voting was not required by law. Voter registration cards presented on election day were retained by election officials so that the failure to vote as evidenced by the lack of a validated voter credential could not be used as the basis of reprisals. Most of the voters appeared to Lassa observers to be voting under no coercive threat. They did not have to vote by law. They were urged to vote but not threatened with the designation of traitors for not voting. There was no obvious means of identifying non-voters, and the government did not kill dissidents, in contrast to the normal practice in El Salvador and Guatemala. In sum, Nicaragua did have a potent coercion package at work to help get out the vote, as did the Salvadoran and Guatemalan governments. 3.4. El Salvador. How the U.S. media transformed a, quote, deranged killing machine, unquote, into the protector of an incipient democracy. In reporting on the 1982 Salvadoran election, the U.S. mass media closely followed the government agenda, the personalities of the candidates, the long lines waiting to vote, alleged rebel disruption, and turnout were heavily featured. As Jack Spence pointed out, quote, Every media outlet, particularly the networks, cast the Election Day story in a framework of voting in the midst of extensive guerrilla violence at polling places, unquote. Warren Hodge and Richard Meislin of the New York Times repeated day after day that the rebels were threatening disruption. Hodge asserting that, quote, the elections have taken on a significance beyond their outcome because leftist guerrillas mounted a campaign to disrupt them and discourage voters from going to the polls, unquote. This is a precise statement of the government's propaganda frame. But Hodge and Meislin never once cited a rebel source vowing disruption, and nobody else did either. On election day, no voters were killed or polling stations attacked, and the general level of rebel military activity was below average. In short, the disruption claims were falsifications of both plans and election day results. But as they fit the patriotic agenda, they were given prominence, repeated frequently, and used to establish the contest between the forces of good and evil. At the election day close, Dan Rather exclaimed, quote, A triumph! A million people to the polls! Unquote. Rather did not regard it as a triumph that the Sandinistas got 700,000 people to the polls, a higher proportion of the population, and without a voting requirement. 
The propaganda frame of the government gave turnout high importance in the Salvadoran election, but none in the Nicaraguan election, and rather followed like a good lap dog. Neither Rather nor any other media analyst on or before March 30, 1982, noted that voting was required by law in El Salvador, and not one mentioned the warning by the defense minister, General Guillermo Garcia, in the San Salvador newspapers that non-voting was treasonous. The basic parameters were entirely off the media agenda. The destruction of La Cronica and El Independiente and the murder of 26 journalists prior to the election were unmentioned in discussing the election's quality and meaning. The army and its allies had been killing civilians on a massive scale in El Salvador for many months before and into March 1982. Would this not create a climate of fear and, in conjunction with a state of siege, somewhat encumber free debate and free choice? The point was rarely even hinted at in the mass media. Could candidates run freely and campaign without fear of murder? Could the rebels qualify and run? After all, if it was a civil war, the rebels were clearly the main opposition— Again, the mass media played dumb. They pretended that this exclusion was not important or that it represented a willful boycott by the rebels rather than a refusal based on conditions unfavorable to a free election and a blatantly stacked deck. Neither the March 1981 death list nor the Gutierrez statement that the FDR would not be permitted to run were mentioned by the mass media in our sample. They never once suggested that the election plan was to create an electoral environment of extreme coercion and bias in which the rebels could not run, and then use this for the dramatic game of disruption and triumphant turnout. That the military agreed to the election because it couldn't lose was never suggested by these media. The role of the army was summarized by Warren Hodge in the New York Times, quote, is the military playing any role in the election? Members of the military are not allowed to vote, and the armed forces are pledged to protect voters from violence and to respect the outcome of the contest, unquote. We may note that the Army's mass killing of civilians and systematic destruction and demobilization of virtually all popular organizations in El Salvador over the preceding 30 months, which bears on what Secretary of State Schultz referred to as the, quote, preliminary aspects that make an election mean something, unquote, is not part of the Army's role for Hodge and the Times. Hodge repeats the Salvadoran Army's pledge, not only taking it at face value, but never suggesting that it, and the election itself, was meaningless in a terror state where the main opposition was off the ballot and only the war parties were able to field candidates. In the propaganda framework, the security forces of client states, quote, protect elections, unquote. Only those of enemy states interfere with the freedom of its citizens to vote without constraint. As noted earlier, observers and reporters in El Salvador all agreed that the populace was most eager for an end to the war, and government propaganda even stressed that voting was an important vehicle to that end. The public was urged to substitute, quote, ballots for bullets, unquote. But no peace party was on the Salvadoran ballot. And after the election was over, the war went on, and the death squads continued to flourish. This is in accordance with the hypothesis that the real purpose of the election was to placate the home population of the United States and render them willing to fund more war and terror. It is a poor fit to the hypothesis that the people of El Salvador had a free choice. An honest press would point up the failure of the election to substitute ballots for bullets. The mass media of the United States did not raise the issue. Nor did the experience of 1982 and its aftermath affect the media's willingness to follow the patriotic agenda once again in 1984. We will return to this below in a statistical comparison of the New York Times' coverage of the Salvadoran and Nicaraguan elections. <laughs> 
3.5. First step, Guatemala opts for moderation. The U.S. government was less deeply involved in the Guatemalan elections of 1984 and 1985 than it was in those held in El Salvador, but, as we saw in Chapter 2, the Reagan administration went to great pains to put a favorable gloss on the murderous regimes of Lucas Garcia, Rios Montt, and Mejia Victores, and to attempt to reintegrate them fully into the Free World Alliance. It encouraged the 1984-85 to elections, provided advisory and financial support for election management, and gave public relations assistance and sent official observers to help put the election in a favorable light. There was little effort made to disguise the fact that the purpose of the election from the standpoint of the Reagan administration and the ruling army was to alter the international image of Guatemala in order to facilitate aid and loans. With the administration supporting the new look, but without the intensity of commitment and propaganda backup brought to bear in El Salvador and given the steady stream of reports of ongoing mass murder in Guatemala, a propaganda model would anticipate a media response that put the Guatemalan elections in a favorable light, but with qualifications. There was, in fact, far less coverage than of the Salvadoran election. What there was had a little more balance, but the apologetic framework was still overwhelmingly dominant. A telling manifestation of bias was the media's ready acceptance of the Guatemalan elections as meaningful, even though they were admittedly for image-making in a context of long-standing army rule and massacre, and despite new institutional arrangements in the countryside, the massive relocations of the population, the model villages, and the civil defense patrols that were, on their face, incompatible with a free election. In an enemy state, where an election was held under comparable conditions, it would be designated a meaningless public relations exercise. In the case of Guatemala, however, the civil patrols and ongoing massacres were rarely mentioned. Sources that addressed these matters were ignored, and the overall tone of the news was cautiously hopeful and optimistic. It was the consensus that the 1984 election for a constituent assembly was, quote, encouraging, unquote, and an important first step, and that the 1985 presidential election, quote, ended, emphasis added, more than 30 years of military domination, unquote, Newsweek, January 17, 1986. Dan Rather, on CBS News, reported that Cerezo became Guatemala's, quote, first civilian leader after 30 years of almost uninterrupted military rule, unquote, December 9th, 1985. This is ambiguous, but the implication directly asserted by Newsweek is that Cerezo, not the army, rules. Julio Mendez Montenegro was a civilian president from 1966 to 1970, but he did not rule. And he was eventually discredited by the fact that he presided over a huge escalation of army violence. Given the earlier experience, the fact that the generals had made it clear that the civilian government was quote, a project, unquote, of the military, and Cerezo's own expressed reservations about his power, objective news reporting would have been careful about an alleged ending of military rule. As in the case of El Salvador, the murderous rule of the Guatemalan generals did not delegitimize them for the U.S. mass media, nor suggest any possible justice to the rebel cause. Time noted, February 27, 1984, that a leftist insurgency, quote, poses a permanent challenge to the regime, unquote, but it did not inquire into the roots of this insurgency or suggest that its leaders constituted a, quote, main opposition, unquote, whose ability to run would be an, quote, acid test, unquote, of election integrity, as they pronounced in Nicaragua. <laughs> 
Time also did not observe that the regime poses a permanent challenge to the survival of its population. The mass murders of the Guatemalan state were even semi-justified by the unquestioned need to quell insurgents. Quote, much of the killing, unquote, says Time, quote, is linked to Mejia's success against the insurgents, unquote. The phrase linked to is an apologetic euphemism to obscure the fact that Mejia's success was based on the mass murder of men, women, and children in literally hundreds of destroyed villages. Mejia has a, quote, mixed record, unquote, with the mass murder offset by, quote, improvements in some important areas, unquote, the State Department, quoted by Time. Mejia, says Time, quote, won support because he has kept the promises he made after seizing power, unquote. Time never explains how it determined that Mejia won support, or from whom, other than the U.S. State Department, was the press then free to speak out? Did a system of justice come into being? In Chapter 2, we summarized America's Watch's demonstration that the Reagan administration made serial adjustments in its apologetics for each successive Guatemalan terrorist general, with a lagged, tacit acknowledgement that it had previously been lying. This has no influence whatsoever on Time's treatment of State Department pronouncements as authentic truth, the standard from which other claims may be evaluated. Thus, Time says that, quote, America's Watch, a controversial group that is often accused of being too sympathetic to the left, called Guatemala a nation of prisoners, unquote. Time doesn't independently evaluate the quality of its sources. The State Department is unchallenged because it expounds the official and patriotic truth. America's Watch is denigrated and only rarely cited even with a dismissing put-down because it challenges official propaganda. Pravda could hardly be more subservient to state demands than time in its coverage of demonstration elections. The mass media's sourcing on the Guatemalan election was confined almost entirely to U.S. officials and official observers, the most prominent Guatemalan political candidates, and generals. Spokespersons for the insurgents, what in Nicaragua would be labeled the, quote, main opposition, unquote, the smaller parties, spokespersons for popular organizations, the churches, human rights groups, and ordinary citizens were essentially ignored by the media. Time, Newsweek, and CBS News almost never talked to ordinary citizens or spokespersons for the insurgents. Stephen Kinzer, in The Times, had only one citation to a rebel source in several dozen articles on Guatemala during the election periods, although on election day in 1984, he did speak with a number of ordinary citizens, who gave a much less optimistic view than Kinzer's usual sources. The restricted menu of media sources flows from and reinforces the media's propensity to adopt a patriotic agenda. U.S. government officials and observers are always optimistic and hopeful in their statements about sponsored elections. The leading contestant politicians are also moderately optimistic, as they have a good chance of acquiring at least nominal power. They do, however, express occasional doubts about whether the army will relinquish power. This allows the election drama to assume a slightly different character than in El Salvador, where it was the Democratic army, quote, protecting the election, unquote versus the undemocratic rebels who refused to lay down their arms and participate. In Guatemala, the frame was, will the generals keep their promise to stay in the barracks? The triumph is that they do stay in the barracks. A civilian president takes office and now, quote, rules, unquote. 
The media then quickly drop the subject, so that whether the army really does relinquish power to the civilian leaders is never checked out. Just as the, quote, peace, unquote, sought by the populace in El Salvador was never considered in retrospect. In Poland in January 1947, and Nicaragua in 1984, and in enemy states generally, the focus was on the substance of power, and the extent to which that power shaped the electoral results in advance, as by limiting the ability of important constituencies to run for office and compete effectively. Not so for Guatemala. If the mass media had enlarged their sources, fundamental conditions would have assumed greater prominence. For example, before both the July 1st, 1984 and December 1985 elections in Guatemala, the Guatemala Bishops' Conference issued pastoral statements that suggested in no uncertain terms and with detailed arguments that conditions in the country were incompatible with a free election. Its pastoral letter of June 8, 1984, focused on the civil defense patrols as, quote, susceptible to manipulation, unquote. And it discussed the disappearances, quote, insatiable corruption, unquote, and the fact that socio-political structures are, quote, not capable of promoting the welfare of the whole society, unquote. Stephen Kinzer mentioned this report in a Times News article of July 22, 1984, but his reference is made after the election of July 1st, and Kinzer did not use it to frame the discussion of electoral conditions and to arrive at an assessment of the quality of the election. Furthermore, his summary of the 27-page report, that it, quote, denounced torture, electoral fraud, concentration of wealth, and massacres of entire families, unquote, ignores the quite specific critique of the conditions bearing on an election. Time mentioned this pastoral letter briefly. Newsweek and CBS News never mentioned it. In connection with the 1985 election, the bishops put forth another powerful statement, once again questioning whether an election can be meaningful in, quote, a situation close to slavery and desperation, unquote. They point out that the civil defense patrols, the, quote, ideology of national security, unquote, and hunger and impoverishment are not conducive to serious elections. Quote, in order that the longed-for results can be obtained, there must be not only the freedom at the moment of casting one's vote, but also a whole series of particular social, political, and economic conditions which are, unfortunately, not happening in Guatemala. In effect, there still persist in Guatemala harsh violence, lack of respect for human rights, and the breaking of basic laws. It is a fact that any citizen pressured, terrorized, or threatened is not fully able to exercise his or her right to vote or to be elected conscientiously, unquote. This letter was not mentioned in the major media or anywhere else, to our knowledge, although the bishops are conservative, credible, and one of the few organized bodies in Guatemala not crushed by state terror. There were other dissenting voices in Guatemala, politicians of the lesser parties, union officials, human rights groups, lawyers and jurists, who spoke out occasionally on the limits to free electoral conditions in Guatemala. And there were events of note that threw a powerful light on the subject. Most of these were blacked out in the U.S. mass media. For example, on July 4, 1984, the Guatemalan Human Rights Commission issued a statement in Mexico saying that the election's meaning should be viewed in the context of three important facts, namely, that the requirements for a meaningful election stipulated by the United Nations in a March 14th statement had not been met that the left had been excluded from participation in the election, and that 115 persons had been murdered or disappeared in the 30 days prior to the election of July 1st. This statement and the facts cited by the commission were ignored in the U.S. press. <laughs> 
Consider also the following facts. On May 3rd, General Oscar Mejia Victores removed Ricardo Sagastume Vidare from his position as President of the Judiciary and the Supreme Court. On April 11th, the Judiciary had issued writs of habeas corpus on behalf of 157 kidnapped individuals, and Sacastume had protested to Mijia Victores over the difficulty in proceeding against military abuses. On May 4th, Asisco Valadares Mojina, head of the Populist Party, noted that Sagastume had been, quote, fired like a simple subordinate, unquote. On May 8th, a communique from the Guatemalan Bar Association stated that in Guatemala there is no rule of law, as demonstrated by the constant violation of human rights and uncontrolled exercise of arbitrary power. By May 8th, at least 16 judiciary officials, including Supreme Court and Court of Appeals magistrates, had resigned in protest at Sagastume's removal. Stephen Kinzer never discussed any of these events or their meaning in The Times, nor did any of his colleagues elsewhere in the mass media. This is in accord with our hypothesis that in elections held in client states, fundamental electoral conditions, such as the presence or absence of the rule of law, are off the agenda. The point applies to other relevant structural conditions. Thus, while Kinzer occasionally mentioned the civil defense patrols, he never described them and their operations in any detail or tied them in with other institutional structures of control, and he failed to relate them in a systematic way to army power. The numerous reports on these coercive institutions and their terrorist role by Amnesty International, America's Watch, and the British Parliamentary Human Rights Group were almost never cited by Kinzer in providing facts relevant to the Guatemalan elections. Although the Constituent Assembly elected in 1984 produced a new constitution, Kinzer never once discussed the nature of this instrument which validated the special army role and structural constraints on freedom of the press. Kinzer was reporting news in a way that fit the Times' editorial position and the U.S. government agenda. The Times' editorial frame was that, quote, the military in power for most of 31 years has honored its promise to permit the free election of a civilian president, unquote. Kinzer's news articles of the same period convey the same message. One of them is entitled, quote, After 30 years, democracy gets a chance in Guatemala, unquote, November 10th, 1985, which accurately summarizes the contents, although they contain an undercurrent of reserved final judgment. That central message was false, however, if the basic conditions of a free election were not met, if the army's power remained unimpaired, and if these were confirmed in a written constitution that allows the army freedom from the rule of law and a license to kill without constraint from the nominal, quote, democracy, unquote, Kinzer could only convey this false message by ignoring the Sagastume case, the institutional arrangements of the counterinsurgency state, the ongoing murders, and the omnipresent fear, i.e. the basic conditions of a free election, and by laying stress instead on expressions of hope, orderliness of the election process, and army promises, i.e. the government's propaganda agenda in a demonstration election. In what must be one of the low points of his journalistic career, in an article of December 27, 1985, Guatemala Vote Heartens Nicaragua Parties, Kinzer even implies that the Guatemala election establishes an electoral model for Nicaragua. He describes a Cerezo visit to Nicaragua in which Kinzer features the encouragement Cerezo gives to the dissident parties that perhaps the power of the Sandinistas can be broken by patience, implying that Cerezo had broken the power of the army in Guatemala and was in full command. 
The article closes with a quote from an opposition figure. Quote, Ortega is now the last president in Central America who wears a military uniform, and the contrast is going to be evident. Unquote. Nowhere in the article does Kinzer point out that the army power cannot be read from whether the head of state wears a uniform, or that the rule of the army in Guatemala has not yet been overcome. He does not refer to the fact that the Guatemalan army has killed tens of thousands of ordinary civilians, nor does he show any recognition of the fact that the election held in Nicaragua was much more open than that held in Guatemala. On the contrary, this is a fact that the media, including the New York Times, explicitly and consistently deny in accordance with state imperatives. As in the case of El Salvador, the U.S. mass media never suggested that the exclusion of the Guatemalan insurgent groups rendered the Guatemalan election meaningless. Kinzer several times mentioned with extreme brevity that the left was off the ballot, but he never asked anybody to discuss the meaning of this in terms of the options available to the various segments of society. As co-author of an important book on this topic, Kinzer is well aware of the facts. The vast majority of Guatemalans are very poor, and they have been entirely excluded from political participation or representation since 1954. The insurgency grew out of the parlous condition and exploitation of that mass, and the absence of any possibility of a democratic process to alleviate injustice and misery, the ruling army had allowed only parties to run and civilians to hold office who agreed, tacitly or explicitly, to keep off the policy agenda all matters of central concern to the impoverished majority. There is no way to measure the strength of popular support for the insurgents. But in light of the fact that they espouse programs well-oriented to the interests of the general population and have been able to maintain an insurgency without significant external aid, and that the army response has been a war against virtually the entire rural population, the rebel claim to be a, quote, main opposition, unquote, would appear to be stronger than that of Arturo Cruz and his upper-class Nicaraguan associates. And if the rebels, or any candidates who would threaten the army and oligarchy in ways appealing to the majority, cannot qualify in a Guatemalan election, is it not essentially fraudulent? This was strongly suggested in both 1984 and 1985 by the Guatemalan Bishops' Conference, but this respectable source, in contrast with Arturo Cruz and Robert Lycan, is blacked out. As with El Salvador... The election was not evaluated, either in advance or in retrospect, on the basis of whether or not the fundamental requirements of a free election were met. For the U.S. government, the insurgents were not a main opposition. Guatemalan state terror was merely a public relations inconvenience, and the elections were fair. The mass media's treatment of the Guatemalan election reflected well this government propaganda agenda. 3.6. Nicaragua. Media service in the delegitimizing process. In contrast with the Salvadoran and Guatemalan cases, the Reagan administration was intent on discrediting the Nicaraguan election, which threatened to legitimize the Sandinista government and thus weaken the case for U.S. funding of a terrorist army. The administration had been berating the Sandinistas for failing to hold an election, but the actual holding of one was inconvenient. From the inception of Nicaraguan planning for the election, therefore, the administration began to express doubts about its quality. And just as it devoted itself to creating a positive image of the two client state elections, so it expended substantial resources to depict the Nicaraguan election in the worst possible light. 
The media dutifully followed course, as a propaganda model predicts. The mass media failed to call attention to the cynicism of first assailing Nicaragua for failing to hold an election and then striving to have an election either postponed or discredited. Time even cites the absence of, quote, official delegations of observers from the major Western democracies, unquote, November 19th, 1984, as if this were evidence of something discreditable to the election, rather than as a reflection of U.S. power. There were some 450-odd foreign observers in attendance at the Nicaraguan election, some with superb credentials, observing more freely and at greater length than the official U.S. observers in El Salvador and Guatemala. Time and the rest of the mass media paid no attention to them. Stephen Kinzer's use of observers is noteworthy. In the case of Nicaragua, he completely ignored the unofficial observers, many exceedingly well qualified to observe, as we have noted, and he even ignored the official Dutch government team, drawn from the center-right and highly apologetic about atrocities in El Salvador, which observed both the Salvadoran and Nicaraguan elections, and concluded that the elections in Nicaragua, quote, were more open than in El Salvador, in the sense that more people were able to take part, that the opposition did not fear for their lives, unquote, and that, quote, the legitimation of the regime is thus confirmed Confirmed, unquote. In Guatemala, by contrast, he cited the official observer report in both the 1984 and 1985 elections despite their great bias and superficiality. See the report discussed in Appendix 1. In the 1984 Guatemala election, Kinzer did refer to the report of the unofficial human rights law group that we cited earlier, quoting their statement that the voting process was, quote, procedurally correct, unquote, but neglecting to note here and elsewhere their numerous statements to the effect that, quote, the greater part of the population lives in permanent fear, unquote, page four, so that, quote, procedural correctness, unquote, has little meaning. With no U.S. government-designated official observers available in Nicaragua, the media relied even more heavily than usual on U.S. government handouts. It is enlightening to compare this conduited propaganda of the mass media with the findings of foreign observer teams on the scene in Nicaragua. For the purpose of this comparison, which follows, we will use two such reports. One, that of the Irish Interparty Parliamentary Delegation, is the elections in Nicaragua, November 1984. The delegation was composed of four individuals, three from right-wing or moderate right political parties who spent 17 days in Nicaragua at the time of the election. We will also use as a basis of comparison of media coverage the previously cited report of the 15-member delegation sent by the Latin American Studies Association, LASA, half of whom had had, quote, substantial field experience, unquote, in Nicaragua itself. This delegation spent eight days in Nicaragua before the election, traveled in a rented bus, determined their own itinerary, and, quote, spoke with anyone who we chose to approach, as well as numerous people who spontaneously approached us, unquote. 3.6.1. Tone of Negativism and Apathy. Time magazine hardly attempts to hide the fact that it takes its cues from Washington. It quotes John Hughes, then a public relations man from the State Department, and previously and subsequently a columnist for the Christian Science Monitor, quote, It was not a very good election. It was just a piece of theater for the Sandinistas, unquote. Time follows this cue with a series of denigrating strokes. Quote, The Sandinistas win, as expected. The Nicaraguan election mood was one of indifference. The outcome was never in doubt. Something of an anticlimax. Unquote. All in the issue of November 19th, 1984. In an earlier article, October 29th, 
Time indulged in the same negative refrain. Quote, a campaign without suspense, unquote. Voters, quote, too apathetic to go to the polls at all, unquote. This was a forecast dredged up well before the election. In both articles, fear was also featured heavily. In the Salvadoran election, Time's tone was different. Quote, There was no denying the remarkable sense of occasion, unquote. I.e., the Reagan administration had a big public relations investment in the election. Quote, Hundreds of thousands braved the threats and sometimes the bullets of the Marxist-led FMLN to join long serpentine polling lines for the country's much-awaited presidential elections, unquote. April 9th, 1984. In Guatemala, too, quote, some 1.8 million voters braved four-hour polling lines, tropical rainstorms, and a bewildering array of political choices to cast ballots on their country's most open and fraud-free elections in more than a decade, unquote. July 16th, 1984. There is never apathy or fear of government force in Time's renditions of demonstration elections. Stephen Kinzer in The Times also took a far less kindly view of the election in Nicaragua than of those in Guatemala, giving enormous attention to election opponents like the U.S. candidate Arturo Cruz, whereas in Guatemala he almost completely ignored the small parties, union protesters, rebels, and human rights groups and finding more people voting out of fear than he did in Guatemala. A remarkable discovery, given the circumstances in the two countries. I'll pause the text to read two footnotes here, one about the so-called FMLN murders in El Salvador, and one about uh, the piece of text that I just read. As in 1982, the FMLN carried out no military operations directed at the election day process and made no threats against the Salvadoran voters. But, as in 1982, this has no impact on time reporting. The real threats broadcast to voters in Nicaragua by Contra Radio and the several Contra killings of poll watchers were never reported by time. As we have noted, the stress on superficialities like long lines is part of the propaganda agenda for a demonstration election. So is blocking out the fact that the length of the lines might be a function of the restricted number of voting booths, as was the case in El Salvador. Time provides both the emphasis on long lines and the suppression of relevant evidence on why the lines were so long. See Herman and Broadhead, Demonstration Elections, pages 126 to 127. That was footnote 90. Footnote 91. Cruz was mentioned by Kinzer in 11 and quoted, usually at some length, in 5 of the 14 articles he wrote on the Nicaraguan election. Disruption and harassment are mentioned or featured in seven of the articles. And back to the text regarding Kinzer's articles in the Times. He focuses steadily on the Sandinistas' efforts to get out the vote. The fact that the election result is a foregone conclusion, claims of the breaking up of election rallies, and allegations of unfairness and withdrawals by the opposition. As with time, the voters are philosophical. Quote, enthusiasm for the election was not universal, unquote. And, quote, there was little visible enthusiasm, unquote. Kinzer did not compare the electoral modalities, range of operations, or other basic conditions in Nicaragua and Guatemala, or El Salvador. In short, 
He discussed different questions in his news reporting on the elections in Nicaragua and Guatemala, adhering closely to the propaganda frame. On the alleged negativism and apathy, both the Irish and Lassa delegations noted that voting was not required in Nicaragua and was entirely secret. Therefore, as the Irish delegation pointed out, the low rate of abstention is more meaningful and, quote, invalidates predictions that large sectors of the population were opposed to the election. Furthermore, the percentage of spoiled votes, 7.4%, is comparable to any European election in a country with a highly literate population, unquote. Page 7. They also note that, quote, speaking with one old man, awaiting his turn to vote in a rural polling station, one member of the delegation inquired, quote, what difference do you see between this and any other election in which you voted, unquote. He replied, quote, everything. Unquote. Quote, in what way? Unquote. He simply shrugged. Quote, everything is different. Unquote. The U.S. media never located anybody like this old man. The Irish delegation also pointed out that, quote, some observers from other countries suggested that the people did not appear enthusiastic as they went to the polls. This is not surprising, as people stood in long queues waiting patiently for their turn to go behind the curtain to mark their ballot paper. One member of the delegation who had the opportunity to observe voters in the American election just two days later noted no greater enthusiasm for standing in queues there. It is our belief that the invariable enthusiasm and optimism found by the U.S. mass media in client state elections and the apathy and negativism found in elections in states disfavored by the U.S. administration has nothing to do with electoral realities and must be explained entirely by an imposed propaganda agenda and the filtering out of contrary opinion and information. 3.6.2 Ignoring the superior quality of the Nicaraguan election In the propaganda format, a great deal of attention is paid to the mechanical properties of elections in client states, but not in states whose elections are being denigrated. This was true in the cases under discussion. Time, April 9, 1984, described in detail the elaborate electoral preparations in El Salvador, the, quote, tamper-proof, unquote, procedures, the use of transparent lucite ballot boxes, and the indelible ink marking and stamping ID cards. It turned out, however, that the high-tech, computerized voting procedures weren't understood by the population, more than half of whom were illiterate. At no point did Time or its media colleagues raise any question about the importance of improving literacy as a necessary prelude to an election, nor did they suggest that the Lucite boxes might compromise the secrecy of the vote, or that the stamped ID card might be a coercive instrument in helping to explain turnout. Nicaragua went to great pains to provide election secrecy and for an easy and intelligible system of voting. For one thing, they had a massive literacy campaign before the election, making electoral printed matter generally accessible. Both the Irish and Lassa delegations mention this as an electoral plus. Nicaragua also put a high priority on getting a complete registration list and getting voters registered. The Irish delegation noted that, quote, recent elections in other Central American countries, such as El Salvador and Guatemala, did not introduce such measures, and there was considerable debate concerning the validity of their registers, which were based on out-of-date census figures, incomplete official registers of population changes, and other sources. Unquote. Page 5. Nicaragua also deliberately avoided transparent ballot boxes, ID stamping, and any other mechanism that would allow the authorities to identify whether or how somebody had voted. Lassa points out that, quote, 
The ballots were also printed on heavy opaque white paper. The contrast with Somoza-era elections is striking. The Somozas used translucent ballots, so virtually everyone assumed that their ballot was not secret. The same problem occurred in the 1984 elections in El Salvador, where thin paper ballots were deposited in transparent ballot boxes. The vote in Nicaragua in 1984 was truly a secret ballot. Page 14. In Nicaragua, also, there was proportional voting, which made it possible for the smaller parties to obtain legislative representation. Parties could also qualify quite easily to participate in the election. In Guatemala, 4,000 signatures were needed to qualify in 1984, a large number and not easy for dissident parties to collect in a society with daily political murders. Stephen Kinzer and his associates never mentioned these differences. More generally, the substantial merits of the Nicaraguan elections were never contrasted with the procedures in the U.S. client states, a comparison that would have been most revealing and that would have thoroughly undermined the Reagan agenda, to which the media were committed in their reporting of the election. Time, as noted, mentioned the compromised Salvadoran procedures as if they were meritorious. The Times mentioned the transparent voting boxes in El Salvador only once, Richard Meislin, on March 25, 1984, repeating without question the official line that the purpose of the translucent boxes was to prevent fraud. Any other possibility is unmentioned. Newsweek and CBS News ignored these matters. 3.6.3. Rebel disruption into the black hole. Turnout no longer an index of triumph of democracy. In the Salvadoran election, rebel disruption was a central feature of the government's propaganda frame. Because the rebels opposed the election, voting by the people proved their rejection of the rebels and approval of the army. Turnout was the index of democratic triumph and rebel defeat. As we saw, the mass media followed this frame without question. In the case of Nicaragua, the propaganda format was reversed. The rebels were the good guys, and the election held by the bad guys was condemned in advance. Rebel opposition to the election and efforts at disruption did not make voting and a large turnout a repudiation of the rebels and approval of the Sandinistas. The U.S. mass media once again followed the government agenda, even though it meant an exact reversal of the standards they had applied in the Salvadoran election. The Contras and their supporters urged the public not to vote and interfered with the election process with at least as much vigor as, and with more killings than, the rebels in El Salvador. Furthermore, voting was more assuredly secret, and the citizens were not required to vote or to have ID cards stamped, indicating that they had. And the Sandinistas did not kill ordinary citizens on a daily basis, as was true in the, quote, death squad democracies, unquote. Thus, turnout was far more meaningful in the Nicaraguan election than in the ones held in El Salvador and Guatemala. The public was free to abstain, as well as to vote for opposition parties. The U.S. mass media disposed of this problem mainly by massive suppression. They simply ignored the contra-U.S. campaign for abstention waged with threats and attacks on polling places and election workers, and they buried the fact of an effectively secret vote and the right not to vote, just as, in parallel, they had inflated rebel disruption efforts in El Salvador in 1982 and 1984 and buried the voting requirement and other pressures to vote. Although the New York Times had gone out of its way to focus on the, quote, challenge, unquote, of rebel opposition and alleged disruption as giving turnout special meaning in the Salvadoran election of 1982, Stephen Kinzer never once mentioned that the Contras attacked a number of polling stations and had issued radio appeals for abstention. For Kinzer, neither these facts nor the U.S. campaign to discredit were seen as posing a challenge that made turnout meaningful in Nicaragua. 
The Irish delegation pointed out that, quote, the parties of the Democratic Coordinating Committee, based in the business community, opposed the voter registration and called for a boycott of this process. Page 5. And it noted that 11 polling stations were closed down by counter-revolutionary activities. Page 7. The public voted in large numbers despite the possible dangers involved, which suggested to the Irish delegation that turnout was significant and, quote, showed how important the election was to the people. Page 6. Lassa pointed out the various ways in which the, quote, main opposition, unquote, called for voter abstention and cited the radio warnings broadcast into the country from Costa Rica threatening that voters would be killed by the Contras, pages 16, 28. Lassa also pointed out that, quote, voter turnout was heavy, unquote, with, quote, more enthusiasm among voters in low-income areas than in more affluent neighborhoods, unquote. Like Time, Lassa notes that the turnout did not quite realize the expectations of FSLN officials, but unlike Time, Lassa points out that the rate of participation achieved, quote, compares very favorably with the rates achieved in 11 other recent Latin American elections, as well as the 1984 U.S. presidential election, unquote, page 16. In sum, the two observer reports discuss rebel disruption in Nicaragua, turnout, and the meaning of that turnout. The U.S. mass media, which had featured these matters heavily in reference to the Salvadoran election, where they fitted the government's propaganda agenda, found them entirely unnewsworthy as regards Nicaragua. 3.6.4 the Revived Sensitivity to Coercion As we described earlier, the, quote, coercion package, unquote, was off the agenda for the U.S. government and mass media in addressing the Salvadoran and Guatemalan elections. So was the element of fear engendered by mass murder and the absence of any rule of law in these U.S. client states. Coercion and fear were back on the agenda, however, for Nicaragua. This revival was illustrated with amazing dishonesty and hypocrisy in time, which had never mentioned fear and pressures from the government as factors possibly explaining turnout in the U.S.-sponsored elections, even after the murder of 50,000 civilians. In Nicaragua, however, the, quote, pugnacious, unquote, Sandinistas had, quote, an awesome monopoly of force, unquote, and getting them to, quote, relax their grip, unquote, which was, quote, essential for free electoral competition, unquote, was extremely dubious. Times Central American correspondent George Russell even located a, quote, Latin American diplomat, unquote, who says, quote, you can't have democracy where there is no personal liberty at all, unquote, October 8th and May 14th, 1984. Russell and Time had never found the Salvadoran government pugnacious, with any awesome monopoly of force, or as having a grip that needed relaxing for electoral competition, and personal liberty was never mentioned as lacking or even pertinent to Salvadoran elections. For the Nicaraguan election, however, Time found that, quote, the pressure to participate was high. Many citizens feared they would lose precious rationing cards, unquote. Further, quote, the government had made it clear that it considered failure to vote a counter-revolutionary stance, unquote. Later, quoting Daniel Ortega, quote, all Nicaraguans who are Nicaraguans are going to vote. The only ones who are not going to vote are sellouts, unquote. November 19th, 1984. As we pointed out earlier, both the Guatemalan and Salvadoran army warned the public that voting was required by law and that non-voting was treasonous. These statements were more precisely warnings, whereas Ortega's was an insult but not a clear threat. Ortega's was the only such statement of its kind reported, and Time's statement that the government, quote, made it clear, unquote, that non-voting was, quote, counter-revolutionary, unquote, is doubly dishonest. The statement, 
was not clearly a warning, and, quote, counter-revolutionary, unquote, is an invidious word concocted by time. The official government position, as expressed in the law, was that Nicaraguans did not have to vote. Time suppresses this fact. It suppresses the secrecy of the ballot and absence of a checkable ID card so that there would have been no way to implement a threat, even if one had been made. It suppresses the fact that the Nicaraguan army did not regularly murder even counter-revolutionaries, whereas the Salvadoran and Guatemalan armies murdered numerous people who weren't revolutionaries, but were somehow in the way. In short, propaganda could hardly be more brazen. Time's alleged, quote, fact that, quote, many, unquote, people feared the removal of the rationing card is contested by Lassa, which states that, quote, in our interviews in many neighborhoods in several cities, we found no evidence that the ration cards were being held back or withdrawn for any reason, unquote. They note that there were five reports filed with the Supreme Electoral Council alleging intimidation by threat of withdrawal of ration cards, quote, but none of these allegations were sustained upon investigation, unquote. Page 27. Time does not indicate the source of its evidence and fails to provide a single illustration of the, quote, many, unquote, cases. We noted earlier that Stephen Kinzer cited more claims of coercion in the Nicaraguan than the Guatemalan elections, a remarkable journalistic achievement, given the unchallenged facts about the actual scale and character of repression in the two states. His playing down of state terror in Guatemala as a basic factor affecting the quality of the election in all its dimensions, the ability of candidates to run, freedom of speech and press, the existence of intermediate groups, endemic fear, and the meaning of turnout, amounts to massive deceit. His Nicaraguan coverage also involved large-scale misrepresentation. He did not point out the absence of mass killings, and he failed to mention the absence of a coercion package. No transparent boxes, no requirement that an ID card be stamped, and no legal obligation to vote. Kinzer's one notice of the voting requirement in his 14 articles on the election amounts to serious deception. He quotes a voter as follows, quote, I've always voted because it is always required, he said. Quote, of course the law says one thing, but after a while one realizes that voting is part of patriotism, and patriotism leads to long life, unquote. Kinzer's source implies, but doesn't say directly, that voting is not legally required in Nicaragua, and this murky statement the closest Kinzer ever comes to acknowledging the absence of a voting requirement, is counterbalanced by his respondent's suggestion that voting may be based on some kind of threat. Both the Irish and Lassa delegations stressed the superior protection of secrecy in the balloting, which, in Lassa's words, was, quote, meticulously designed to minimize the potential for abuses, unquote, page 15. They also emphasized the fact that voting was not required by law, and that, contrary to the U.S. government propaganda expounded by Time and other media entities, the coercive elements in getting out the vote were small. Human rights abuses by the government that contribute to an environment of fear, Lassa pointed out, were, quote, on a very small scale, unquote, when, quote, compared to other nations in the region, unquote, page 28. In fact, they note that fear in Nicaragua is directed more to the United States and the Contras than to the government in Managua. 3.6.5. The, quote, main opposition, unquote, to the fore. As we saw in El Salvador and Guatemala, the fact that the insurgents were off the ballot did not phase the U.S. media one bit. Neither did Duarte's acknowledgement in 1981 that, quote, the masses were with the guerrillas, unquote, when he joined the junta a year earlier, which would clearly make them a, quote, main opposition, unquote. 
Nor were the media affected by the army's murder of the opposition leadership in both El Salvador and Guatemala. In El Salvador, the exclusion of the rebels was part of the U.S. government's electoral plan. They were, therefore, not a main opposition, and the debarment and even murder of their leaders did not compromise election quality. In the Nicaraguan case, in sharp contrast, the U.S. government worked with a different frame. The exclusion of its sponsored rebels and any other candidates was a serious matter that threatened the quality of the election. The media followed like good little doggies. Lap rather than watch. The central dramatic propaganda line for the Nicaraguan election pressed by U.S. officials was the alleged struggle of Arturo Cruz to include the Sandinistas to create an open system in which he would be able to compete fairly. The failure of the Marxist-Leninists to make adequate concessions, Cruz's refusal to compete, and the subsequent exclusion of the, quote, main opposition, unquote. Cruz, however, was a, quote, main opposition, unquote, only in the propaganda construct of the U.S. government and mass media. A longtime expatriate who now concedes that he was on the CIA payroll with no mass base in Nicaragua, Cruz would almost certainly have done poorly in a free election. I'll pause to read footnote 100 at that. On April 23, 1985, the Wall Street Journal revealed that Cruz was on the CIA payroll. Oliver North then took over his financing, hoping that this might divert attention from the fact that Cruz had been funded by the CIA during the period when the U.S. government was trying to discredit the Nicaraguan elections. See Stephen Engelberg, New York Times, July 15, 1987. And now, back to the text. There is good reason to believe that Cruz never intended to run, but that he and his sponsors had held out this possibility precisely to allow the propaganda frame to be used effectively. The mass media focused on the Cruz drama heavily and uncritically. Cruz was given enormous play. He was continually referred to as the, quote, main opposition, unquote, or, quote, leading opponent, unquote, of the ruling party, without any supporting evidence. And his candidacy was made, quote, an acid test of the Sandinistas' democratic institutions, unquote. Time, October 29th, 1984. For the Times, the election would be a sham without Cruz, editorial October 7, 1984, and its news columns placed main opposition Cruz on center stage, from which vantage point he could regularly denounce the proceedings as a, quote, farce, unquote, or sham. The Times did have one good backpage article that provided evidence that Cruz had not intended to run or would not have been allowed to run by his closest Nicaraguan allies and U.S. officials, and that his function was, as we stated, to discredit the election by pretending to be interested, thus capturing press attention. But this low-keyed article stood alone and did not alter the unremitting focus on the alleged exclusion of this alleged main opposition as the centerpiece of the Nicaraguan election drama. In focusing on an alleged, quote, main opposition, unquote, in Nicaragua, which voluntarily chose not to run, while ignoring a real main opposition in El Salvador, excluded by force and plan, the mass media simply adopted without question the government's propaganda framework. Sources that would speak to the condition of the main opposition in El Salvador and the significance of its exclusion, both Salvadorans and foreign observers, were simply ignored. In the case of the Nicaraguan election, in contrast, Cruz and U.S. government officials were given the floor to present their themes, which were transmitted on a daily basis with no accompanying notice of their possible falsity and manipulative intent in perfect accord with the expectations of a propaganda model. 
The Reagan administration not only dangled Cruz before the media, it tried hard to induce or bribe other candidates in the Nicaraguan election to withdraw in order to fulfill the prophecy of a meaningless election. The brazenness of this intervention by a great power was remarkable, but the U.S. media gave it minimal attention. They never denounced it as anti-democratic. They failed to link it to Cruz's campaign with its suggestion of a larger effort to discredit by boycott. And they never suggested that voter, quote, turnout, unquote, was more meaningful given the active U.S. campaign to discredit the election. On October 31st, 1984, Stephen Kinzer noted that senior U.S. officials confirmed accounts of, quote, regular contacts, unquote, with the Nicaraguan parties. Kinzer's article is headlined, Nicaraguan parties cite Sandinista and U.S. pressure. The headline and article itself equating the government's aid to and agreements with its own political parties with U.S. intervention to get the Nicaraguan parties to boycott the election. CBS, Newsweek, and Time ignored the U.S. bribe program entirely. Time gave great emphasis to the number of candidates and the withdrawal of several, but it never once mentioned that this was helped along by U.S. connivance, bribes, and pressure. It even quotes, without comment, the State Department fabrication that, quote, it did not try to influence the outcome of the election, unquote, November 19th, 1984. All substantive evidence is placed in the black hole. In the same article, Time asserts that, quote, the U.S. had pushed hard for elections in which all parties felt free to participate, unquote, a fabrication of considerable audacity. As regards the scope of electoral options in Nicaragua, the Irish delegation noted that, quote, the political parties law guarantees participation to all political parties of all ideologies, unquote. An interesting point validated by a range of political opinion in the contesting parties far wider than that found in El Salvador and Guatemala or the United States. Lassa states that, quote, no major political tendency in Nicaragua was denied access to the electoral process in 1984, unquote, page 18. This, of course, could not be said of El Salvador and Guatemala. These important features of the Nicaraguan law and practice were not mentioned in the U.S. media or compared with those of the client states. The Irish delegation stressed two facts about Cruz as the, quote, main opposition, unquote. First, quote, the delegation found no evidence that these parties, the three small Cruz-related parties that boycotted the election, had wide support within the country. Speaking with many political figures, including representatives of the legitimate opposition parties, it became clear that the intention of Arturo Cruz to stand for election was dubious from the start. While considerable coverage was given to these parties in the international press, members of the delegation found that their impact along the population was scant, and few people supported their policies. Page 7. Second, the Irish delegation stressed the fact that the populace was free not to vote, or to spoil votes, and the low level of both, quote, despite the abstentionism promoted by, unquote, the Cruz parties deflated their claims to any serious support, page 7. The Lassa report reached similar conclusions based on an extensive review of the evidence, namely, one, that, quote, circumstantial evidence, unquote, indicates the strong probability that Cruz had no intention of running, and two, that he had no mass base, and would have been badly beaten. In retrospect, Kinzer concedes the fact, although with the customary propaganda twist, he writes that, quote, Ortega's landslide victory was never in doubt, unquote, because, quote, the opposition was splintered, unquote, and, as he fails to observe, had no popular base in contrast to the well-organized Sandinista party, 
and, quote, because the Sandinistas controlled the electoral machinery, unquote. Neither he nor anyone else has offered a particle of evidence that Sandinista control over the electoral machinery made the elections a sham, or to contest the conclusion of the Lassa delegation that, quote, the FSLN did little more to take advantage of its incumbency than incumbent parties everywhere, including the United States, routinely do, unquote. A few days earlier, Kinzer had quoted Arturo Cruz as observing that the Sandinistas deserve credit for having overthrown Somoza and, quote, having broken barriers in Nicaragua that had to be broken, and that is irreversible, unquote, because, quote, the Sandinistas were working in the catacombs while we in the traditional opposition were out of touch with the rising expectations of the masses, unquote. As Kinzer knows, but will not write, the same was true at the time of the 1984 elections, which is why the Sandinista victory was never in doubt. This deceitful dismissal of the 1984 elections is one of Kinzer's many contributions to the media campaign to contrast the, quote, elected presidents, unquote, of the four Central Americans, quote, democracies, unquote, with the Sandinista dictator Ortega, not an elected president by U.S. government imprimatur. The specific context was the massive media campaign to attribute the failures of the Guatemala City Peace Agreement of August 1987 to the Sandinistas, in accordance with Reagan administration priorities, on the eve of the crucial congressional vote on renewed Contra aid. Lassa also stresses the fact that Cruz, effectively representing the Contras, a segment of the local business community, and the United States, could have run in the Nicaraguan election with excellent funding, ample media access, and without fear of being murdered. Even without Cruz, the Contras had an electoral voice. Lassa notes that, quote, we know of no election in Latin America or elsewhere in which groups advocating the violent overthrow of an incumbent government have themselves been incorporated into the election process, particularly when these groups have been openly supported by a foreign power. The Contras nevertheless had a voice in the 1984 election campaign. Two of the Coordinadora-affiliated parties, the PSD and the PLC, supported their inclusion in the elections. And while denying that they represented the Contras, Arturo Cruz and the Gobernadora seemed to endorse and promote their cause, both within Nicaragua and abroad. Page 18, unquote. Lassa also discusses in some detail the U.S. intervention in the election, noting the terrorizing overflights by the U.S. planes during the election campaign, and considering at some length the U.S. efforts to induce the withdrawal of candidates. Lassa reported the claims by both liberal and conservative party figures that the United States offered specific and large sums of money to get candidates to withdraw from the election. 3.6.6 The Concern Over Freedom of the Press and Assembly Not only the rights of any and all candidates to run for public office, but other basic conditions that had been off the agenda in El Salvador and Guatemala were of deep concern to the U.S. government and mass media in reference to Nicaragua. The New York Times, Time, Newsweek, and CBS News all put great stress on the trials and tribulations of La Prensa. Although during the Salvadoran election, none of them had even mentioned the destruction by physical violence and murder of La Cronica and El Independiente, or the toll of murdered journalists. Mob violence allegedly organized by the government and the threat of the neighborhood defense committees were featured by time in Nicaragua, whereas Orden and the death squads in El Salvador and Guatemala it had never mentioned as pertinent to election quality. Basic conditions of a free election were not only back on the media agenda, but there were strong suggestions that Nicaragua was failing to meet these conditions. These suggestions were based almost entirely on quotes from U.S. officials and Cruz and his allies in Nicaragua. 
The media never gave evidence of having actually looked into these matters for themselves or tapped independent sources of evidence. Richard Wagner on CBS News, November 3, 1984, citing, as usual, Arturo Cruz as the, quote, strongest opposition, unquote, also mobilizes a single Nicaraguan citizen, no doubt selected at random, who says, quote, how can this be free elections when we don't have freedom of speech, freedom of the press, unquote. Wagner says that, quote, in addition to censorship, unquote, there were food shortages, a deteriorated transportation system, an unpopular draft, and church opposition, so that, quote, it becomes apparent why a free and open election is not in the cards, unquote. The cynicism in failing to raise the question of why there are food shortages and a deteriorated transport system in Nicaragua is remarkable. Wagner also misses another distinction between Nicaragua and El Salvador. The former has an unpopular draft, whereas in the terror state of El Salvador, there is no draft. Instead, there is press ganging of young men into the army from the slums, refugee camps, and rural areas, while the young sons of the wealthy live the high life in San Salvador and Miami. Much the same is true in Guatemala and Honduras. Wagner's double standard is also remarkable. In El Salvador, in 1982 and 1984, there was far more severe censorship, including outright murder, food shortages, a deteriorating transport system, and church opposition, and more pertinent, a complete exclusion of the main opposition and massive state terror. But these didn't make it apparent to CBS News that a free and open election was not in the cards in that U.S.-sponsored election. The Irish delegation and Lassa, especially the latter, addressed these issues, gave evidence of having examined them seriously, and came up with conclusions sharply at odds with the U.S. government media portrayals. Lassa provided an extensive discussion of the Sandinista Defense Committees and the scope of the Torba violence and interference with freedom of assembly, concluding that the total number of disruptive incidents reported was, quote, quite small, unquote, and that the most serious occurred before the official campaign began. Quote, in spite of Daniel Ortega's unfortunate statement on these disruptions, there is no evidence that the FSLN has a coherent strategy of stimulating or orchestrating them, unquote. page 24. As regards the defense committees, Lassa concluded that they did not seem to be functioning as a spying network and that there was no serious evidence that they were a force making for intimidation, page 27. Lassa makes two additional points ignored by the free press. One is that the Electoral Commission, quote, placed paid advertisements in the press urging citizens to respect the rights of all political parties to hold rallies without interference, unquote, page 24. The second is that the Cruz rallies that were disrupted were held in violation of the electoral law, which requires permits for campaign rallies and promises police protection. Quote, in other words, given their decision not to register, Cruz and the Coordinadora were deliberately campaigning outside of the legal framework of protections which had been created by the electoral law, unquote. Page 25. Lassa also compares the violence in the Nicaraguan election with that elsewhere in the area and in the Nicaraguan context, concluding that, quote, compared to other nations in the region, and in the face of a war against the Contras, such abuses are on a very small scale, unquote, page 28. Lassa also discussed freedom of the press, which it regards as one of the election's most troublesome features. It considers the imposition of press censorship to have been damaging to the election's quality and credibility, even though the argument of the Sandinistas that a country at war, quote, can't allow a newspaper, which is the instrument of the enemy, to publish its opinions freely, unquote, Sergio Ramirez, is viewed as not wholly unreasonable. Nevertheless, while the censorship was also somewhat arbitrary and legalistic, Lassa concluded that, quote, the opposition could and did get its message out, unquote, page 26. And the finding overall was that the Nicaraguan election, quote, 
by Latin American standards, was a model of probity and fairness, unquote. Page 32. The U.S. mass media did not concur, but it is striking how they avoid comparisons and data. The way in which the media can denounce restrictions on freedom of the press in Nicaragua after having totally ignored the question in El Salvador, where restrictions were far more severe, is remarkable. This process of dichotomization is so internalized that the writers use the double standard within the same article, apparently unaware of their own bias. In an article in the New York Times on March 12, 1984, quote, clear choices in Salvador, murky plans in Nicaragua, unquote, Hedrick Smith regards the choices as, quote, clear, unquote, in El Salvador, whereas in Nicaragua, the problem is whether in an election the Sandinistas will, quote, give up significant power and control, unquote. Multiple parties from the far right to the center right in El Salvador demonstrate clear choices, but a variety of parties from right to far left in Nicaragua didn't cause Smith to perceive real choices there, although he didn't explain why. It apparently never occurs to Smith that there is an issue of whether the army and the United States quote, will give up power and control, unquote, and their determination to fight to victory by the electoral route in El Salvador. Are there essential freedoms and absence of coercion in El Salvador that are necessary for a truly free election? Hedrick Smith talks about the substantive electoral conditions only in Nicaragua. He provides extensive detail on the trials of La Prensa, press censorship, the Sandinista monopoly of power, and limits allegedly imposed on opposition candidates in Nicaragua. Not a word, however, on death squad and army murders of civilians in El Salvador, or the draconian laws of the state of siege. How many journalists have been killed in El Salvador? Papers closed, radio stations blown up, union leaders and political figures murdered. These questions are off the agenda in U.S. staged elections, and Hedrick Smith ignores them. As a de facto spokesman for his government, the Times commentator uses doublethink with as much insouciance as Reagan and Schultz. 3.7 Quantitative Evidence of Systematic Media Bias To demonstrate more rigorously the structural bias in media coverage of third world elections, Tables 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3 compare the topics mentioned in the New York Times in its articles on the Nicaraguan and Salvadoran elections of 1984. The tables are organized according to the U.S. government agenda described earlier. The elements in the upper part of the tables are the approved issues, rebel disruption, personalities, election mechanics, etc., that the government wishes to stress in its sponsored elections. Below the line are the basic conditions and other negative elements that are off the agenda in sponsored elections. Our hypothesis is that the media will follow the agenda stressing personalities and other elements above the line in sponsored elections and playing down basic conditions, whereas in elections like that in Nicaragua, the agenda will be reversed. The stress will be placed on basic conditions. It can readily be seen in Table 3.1 that in the Salvadoran election, the Times' news coverage dealt heavily with subjects above the line and neglected the basic conditions that make an election meaningful in advance. We can observe how the Times totally ignores the question of freedom of the press, organizational freedom, and limits on the ability of candidates to run. Table 3-2s shows how the Times treated the forthcoming Nicaraguan election in the same two-month period covered in Table 3-1. It is evident that the paper focuses heavily on the fundamental conditions of a free election, i.e. on topics that it was entirely ignoring while addressing the Salvadoran election. Table 3-3 shows the breakdown of topics covered by the Times during the Nicaraguan election later in the year. Again, although the differences are less marked than the ones in Tables 3-1 and 3-2, the substantial attention to basic conditions in the Nicaraguan case is clear, reflecting editorial news choices that follow a patriotic agenda.
As the basic conditions for a free election were superior in Nicaragua and the coercive elements less acute, the emphasis on basic conditions only in the Nicaraguan case is even more clearly evidence of systematic bias. 3.8. The MIG crisis staged during Nicaragua's election week. As Newsweek pointed out on November 19, 1984, quote, the story of the freighter to Nicaragua allegedly carrying MiGs first broke during the election night coverage, unquote. But at no point does Newsweek or Time or The Times or CBS News suggest that the timing was deliberate. The Times, in its extensive coverage of the MiGs that weren't there, at one point quotes a Nicaraguan official who suggests that the crisis was purely a public relations operation, but that exhausts the Times' exploration of this point. Although the MiGs weren't there, and the timing was perfect for diverting attention from a successful election that the Reagan administration had been attempting to discredit, the elite media asked no questions even in retrospect. The administration claimed that when the freighter was loaded, satellite observation was blocked so that the cargo was unknown. The mass media presented this as fact, making no effort to evaluate the claim. What the media chose to focus on was administration assessments of what it might do if MiGs were in fact being delivered. This allowed the whole frame of discourse to shift to the assumption that the Nicaraguans had done something, and something intolerable to boot. Newsweek, in a retrospective article entitled, quote, The MiGs That Weren't There, unquote, had a lead head, quote, to bring in high-performance craft indicates that they are contemplating being a threat to their neighbors, unquote. The fact that the MiGs weren't brought in, as stated in the article's very title, that this was a concoction of U.S. officials, doesn't interfere with imputing an intention to the Nicaraguans based on a non-existent fact. The assertion that they were contemplating being a threat as opposed to defending themselves against a proxy invasion, is also a patriotic editorial judgment. Newsweek also says in the text that, quote, all sides appeared to be playing a very clumsy and very dangerous game, unquote. This is an intriguing form of even-handedness. A person who, admittedly, had been falsely accused of robbery by an assailant is alleged to be, quote, playing a dangerous game, unquote, along with the attacker who is also the bearer of false witness. In the middle of an article on the Nicaraguan election, Time inserts the government claim that a ship carrying crates of the type used to transport MiG-21s was due at a Nicaraguan port. Time never questions a government propaganda ploy, no matter how blatant, and it offers retrospective only when the government tacitly concedes it had deliberately deceived. Like Newsweek and The Times, Time allows the government to set the agenda with a public relations statement. If the Nicaraguans did this, it would be a challenge to the United States. How then would we react? What are our policy options, etc.? The truth of the claim and the likelihood that this is a manipulative ploy to help remove the unwanted elections from attention are not discussed, and naturally, the fact that this is part of a policy of aggression against a tiny victim is never raised. The only credits in the media coverage of the MiG crisis go to CBS News. On November 6th, Dan Rather gave the straight administration news that MiGs might be on their way and that a strategic option to destroy them was under consideration. On November 7th and 8th, however, perhaps out of a recognition that it had once again been used, CBS gave substantial coverage to Nicaraguan Foreign Minister Miguel de Scoto's rebuttal, which allowed him to point out the absurdity of the Nicaraguan threat, the tie-in of the MiG claims to the Nicaraguan election, and the U.S. refusal to go along with the Contadora peace proposals.
The MiG ploy was nevertheless entirely successful. A tone of crisis was manufactured and options against the hypothetical Sandinista threat were placed at the center of public attention. The Nicaraguan election was not discussed. Lassa points out that, quote, the final results of Nicaragua's election were not even reported by most of the international media. They were literally buried under an avalanche of alarmist news reports, unquote, page 31. Lassa concludes that the Nicaraguan electoral process was manipulated, as the U.S. government claims, but by the U.S. government itself in its efforts to discredit an election that it did not want to take place. The Salvadoran and Guatemalan elections successfully legitimized the U.S.-backed regimes, at least for American elite opinion. The far more honest Nicaraguan election failed to accomplish this thanks to the loyal service of the media. 3.9. The role of official observers in reinforcing a propaganda line. Official observers provide a perfect example of the use of government-controlled experts and pseudo-events to attract media attention and channel it in the direction of the propaganda line, and they regularly succeed in doing this in demonstration elections no matter how brief their stay and foolish their comments. See Appendix 1. The media take it for granted that official observers are newsworthy. They are notables. Their selection by the government from reputable institutions adds to their credibility, and their observations will have effects on opinion and policy. This rationale is in the nature of a self-fulfilling prophecy. They have effects only because the media accord them attention. As the official observers reliably commend the elections as fair without the slightest attention to basic conditions, the media's regular use of these observers for comments on election quality violates norms of substantive objectivity in the same manner as the use of any straight government handout by the Times or Pravda. The Nicaraguan election was remarkable for the number of foreign observers and observer teams. We pointed out earlier that Time mentions 450 foreign observers, but the magazine failed to cite any one of them, relying instead, and characteristically, on State Department handouts. As we saw, the State Department was able to get the media to follow its agenda, even though this involved them in a blatant reversal of the criteria they had employed the same year in El Salvador and Guatemala. It was also able to induce the media to disregard the outcome of the Nicaraguan election with the help of the diversionary MIG ploy. The media also allowed major lies to be institutionalized. For example, that coercion was greater and pluralistic choices less in Nicaragua than in the Salvadoran and Guatemalan elections. And that the latter were legitimizing in a substantive sense in contrast with Nicaragua. These propaganda lies could not have been perpetrated if such reports as those of the Irish delegation and Lassa had been accorded proper weight. Lassa actually contacted the major mass media outlets and tried to interest them in doing a story on their report. Lassa was turned down by every major outlet. The Lassa report is probably the best documented and most closely reasoned observer report ever written. Its authors are far and away the most qualified group ever to write such a report, half with field experience in Nicaragua, and the document was an official report of the major scholarly organization that deals with Central America. The authors represent a variety of opinions. On balance liberal, but revealing a strong critical capability, and in no sense biased, as are the official observer teams to whom the media accord much attention. Their report covers every issue of importance and openly confronts and weighs evidence. If one reads the Lassa report, and then the accounts of the Nicaraguan election in Time, Newsweek, and the New York Times, it is not so much the difference in conclusions that is striking, but the difference in depth, balance, and objectivity. <laughs>
Lassa offers serious history and context, a full account of the organization of the election, and a full discussion of each relevant issue with comparisons to other elections. We believe that an important reason the mass media failed to use Lassa as a source of information was that its report contradicts in every way the propaganda claims which the media were disseminating daily and uncritically. Thus, its very credibility, objectivity, and quality were disturbing and necessitated that it be bypassed by institutions serving a propaganda function. 3.10. Concluding Note As we have seen, electoral conditions in Nicaragua in 1984 were far more favorable than in El Salvador and Guatemala, and the observer team of LASA found the election in Nicaragua to have been, quote, a model of probity and fairness, unquote, by Latin American standards. In El Salvador and Guatemala, none of the five basic preconditions of a free election were met. In both of these countries, state-sponsored terror, including the public exposure of mutilated bodies, had ravaged the civilian population up to the very day of the elections. In both, voting was required by law, and the populace was obliged to have ID cards signed testifying that they had voted. In both, the main rebel opposition was off the ballot by law, by credible threat of violence, and by plan. Nevertheless, in exact accord with the propaganda line of the state, the U.S. mass media found the large turnouts in these countries to be triumphs of democratic choice, the elections legitimizing and fledgling democracies thus created. This was accomplished in large part by the media's simply refusing to examine the basic conditions of a genuinely free election and their application to these client state elections. Only for the Nicaraguan election did the media look at matters such as freedom of the press, and they did this with conspicuous dishonesty. Despite its superiority on every substantive count, the Nicaraguan election was found by the media to have been a sham and to have failed to legitimize. Given the earlier similar performance of the mass media in the cases of the U.S.-sponsored elections in the Dominican Republic in 1966 and Vietnam in 1967, we offer the tentative generalization that the U.S. mass media will always find a third-world election sponsored by their own government a, quote, step toward democracy, unquote and an election held in a country that their government is busily destabilizing, a farce and a sham. This is, of course, what a propaganda model would predict, although the degree of subservience to state interests in the cases we have examined was extraordinary, given the absence of overt coercion. The filters yield a propaganda result that a totalitarian state would be hard put to surpass. Having perpetrated a successful fraud in the interests of the state, the media proceeded, in subsequent years, to reinforce the imagery established by their deception. Guatemala and El Salvador were new democracies with elected presidents. Nicaragua, in contrast, is a Marxist-Leninist dictatorship that does not have an elected president and would never permit elections unless compelled to do so by U.S. force. On December 1, 1987, the New York Times, in an editorial urging the administration not to betray Haitian Democrats by, quote, shrugging off impoverished and anarchic Haiti as a hopeless case, unquote, states that doing so, quote, would undermine Washington's protestations about the need for free elections in Nicaragua, unquote. The wording is murky, and the remarks on Haiti characteristically ignore Washington's support of the Duvalierists who made the elections a mockery. But it is clear that the Times accepts the Reagan line that free elections were not held in Nicaragua in 1984, and that the U.S. goal is to bring about free elections. This line is based on major falsifications, but in keeping with their propaganda function, the Times, as well as the other major media, find Big Brother's portrayal of elections in Central America to be true, by hook or by crook. As we stressed earlier, the media's adherence to the state propaganda line is extremely functional. 
Just as the government of Guatemala could kill scores of thousands without major repercussion because the media recognized that these were unworthy victims, so today aid to state terrorists in El Salvador and Guatemala and the funding of Contra attacks on soft targets in Nicaragua depend heavily on continued media recognition of worth and an appropriate legitimization and delegitimization. As their government sponsors terror in all three states, as well as in Honduras, we may fairly say that the U.S. mass media, despite their righteous self-image as opponents of something called terrorism, serve, in fact, as loyal agents of terrorism. So ends chapter three of Manufacturing Consent. Uh, as always, I'll leave you with my thoughts, and I'm going to try to keep them brief because this was quite a long chapter. We're approaching the three-hour mark now. Um, uh, hey, everybody, it's been a while uh, since I updated this book, and at all, um, I am back to recording. Uh, it has been a bit. My laptop was stolen uh, straight out the car, and uh, it turns out that I cannot record these and uh, make them without it. Um, and then for other various personal reasons, I was unable to record. Um but I am back and happy to be doing this again. This chapter, uh, just uh, uh, how little has, has changed in terms of official uh, news media. Um, it's it's uh, fairly absurd. I mean, there is no, obviously, uh, left uh, uh, mainstream news outlet in the United States to this day. Not that it would much matter as uh, the kind of capitalist uh, insistence on advertisement models would you know, necessitate those uh, papers' destruction inevitably, papers or, or stations or what have you. Um, I think we still see this today in terms of worthy and unworthy victims, in terms of what the media is willing to uh, parrot. Um, you know, uh, police sources, uh, 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 there was a recent um, John Oliver episode on... Um, uh, Local news is reliance on the police as uh, their primary source uh, regarding breaking stories about crime uh, and why that's problematic, which it obviously is for many obvious reasons, uh, a few of which being, you know, that the police are often protecting themselves. I mean, we've seen all of us, the the official police uh, uh, press release on um, George Floyd's murder uh, at the hands of Derek Chauvin and, and others. Um, I believe it was something along the lines of um, man dies uh, in medical incident after interaction with police or something like that. Something along those lines, that disingenuous. Uh, and that the news still parrots these official uh, state lines is uh, fully absurd. By the way, uh, based on this chapter, I don't know how... I, I, I need to Google uh, how Stephen Kinzer is doing right now because it seems like he, the uh, chapter three of this book uh, decapitates him and throws his uh, head into a river somewhere. Like, it just... What? I... Wow. It, I didn't know that I was going to witness a murder uh, in this book, and yet here we are. Um, incredible stuff. Uh, a lot of it, um, I've been recently teaching uh, the Odyssey again um, to my students, and uh, I'm reminded in this chapter of the fact that, and this is going to be a bit of a walk, but I'll, I'll go there. I hope, you, I hope you'll join me. Uh, the fact that the color blue did not exist as a word or concept exactly in ancient Greek in the language. There was no word that directly translates to our word blue. That's why in the Odyssey you hear uh, like the wine dark sea or the sea purple, the purple sea. The, the, there are grays, greens, and purples that are intermittently uh, used for shades of color that we would know as blue ourselves. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm saying this is truth Objectivity, you know, we're all looking at the same wavelength of light objectively that we, you and I, uh, in the English-speaking world, choose to describe as blue. But human objectivity is not so simple a thing. There are so many concepts that 
surface level appear objective that are actually culturally, socially constructed. For example, the color blue. Something you would never imagine to be a social construct, and yet it is, undeniably so, in the evidence of these languages. So, it's a dangerous thing that the media purports to objectivity and that so many people believe that there is a, there is a possibility of objectivity or as close as you can get. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't strive to see all sides of an issue, but you have to recognize that no one is capable of being purely objective, that bias exists. And if, if you do consider that, you are far less likely to simply parrot propaganda lines of agents of the state. Now, of course, the media uh, have other motivations for parroting these lines, as discussed in other chapters of Manufacturing Consent. Namely, um, if you start, I don't know, super-duper critically assessing the lines of the police and the state uh, department, maybe they're not going to give you so many scoops and maybe your station's going to go under. Again, it's the profit motive that, that destroys basically everything. Uh, there's also the idea of worthy and unworthy victims. You know, uh, Is it going to make a profit if we talk about uh, the kidnapping of, let's say, uh, an African-American child as opposed to a white child from an affluent neighborhood? Well, uh, terrible news, it's, it's not. And so those cases are reported with far less gusto and frequency. It's a deeply sad place uh, in which we live, everybody. That's just what I'm going to say about it. Um, all right, like I said, I was going to keep my comments brief. I'm back, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, before I go, I would like to thank my patrons on Patreon who have continued to support me despite my absence. Very generous of you. And those patrons are Michael Rudge, Darth Malik135, Chris Kilbasa, Bylet, Bo Whitney, Jacob Jubeck, and Bonnie. Thank you, all of you, so, so much for your continued support of the channel. And uh, I really, really appreciate you. Uh, as always, uh, that's going to do it for me. So go ahead and get out there and seize the means of production, my little anarchist friends.